Sergeants, can we start the recordings? Get your recording started. Cloud recording is up. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Martinez. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council executive budget hearing for fiscal year 2022. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for identification purposes. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Excuse me. Thank you very much, uh, Sergeant, and thank you to all the sergeants and, of course, to Carl Dalva as well for all the work that you do for all of us. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's ninth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Helen Rosenthal. We are also joined by the following council members. <clears throat> uh, council member um, Gredenchik, Adams, Andrew Samuel, Moya, uh, Powers, Powers, Mario, Chin, uh, Lewis, and Gibson. Today we will hear from the Office of Management and Budget and we welcome Director Jacques Gia to our hearing this morning. The release of the fiscal 2022 executive financial plan paints an improved fiscal outlook for New York City's budget. Since the release of the preliminary budget, we have seen a massive and much needed infusion of federal dollars that helped stabilize the city's budget. Specifically, the federal stimulus acts passed in December and March added 15.2 billion to the city's budget over the span of the financial plan. Of that, $7 billion is designated for education and $5.9 billion is spread across 27 different agencies. This funding will be used to pay for an array of initiatives and programs of which the council is broadly supportive, such as 3K expansion and the mental health teams at the fire department and health and hospitals. But while I understand that the federal stimulus funding was intended to be spent quickly and the eligibility rules prevent its use for things like reserves and tax cuts. We must still think about the long-term implications of how this funding will be deployed. A review of the plan reveals that the administration is heavily relying on the non-recurring federal funding to pay for recurring expenses. This clearly begs the question of how the city will be able to foot the bill once the federal money runs out. We need to know that the mayor is focused on ensuring the long-term stability of the city's budget instead of just passing the buck to the next administration and council to figure out how to continue funding these programs. Yet even with all the spending that the mayor is undertaking in this budget, there are some glaring omissions that the council expects the administration to address by budget adoption. In our budget response, we highlighted several priority areas that were simply ignored in the executive budget. For example, while the budget does spend heavily on education, there is no targeted funding for class size reduction and the council seeks $250 million for that initiative. And even though food insecurity remains a widespread problem, in my district, the food pantry lines still loop around the block. The mayor did not include the council's request for additional funding for small community-based food pantries or home-delivered meals for seniors and the homebound. On the housing front, the mayor also did not need the council's calls for continued funding to, for the for the de-densify hotel shelters to make stabilization bed sites permanent or to increase the size of rental assistance vouchers. Much of what the council is seeking could be added to the budget without increasing its total size. If the mayor got serious about finding agency efficiencies and focus spending on priority rather than legacy programs, there would be more resources available for these vital projects and there would be fewer risks to the budget in the long term. As has been the case over the course of this administration, the savings plan is anemic 
and relies mostly on non-recurring schemes and re-estimates that do nothing to increase agency efficiency. This is Mayor de Blasio's eighth and final budget, and for many of us, this will be our last budget as council members. In my 12 years at the council, and in particular during my last four years as finance chair, in partnership with Speaker Johnson, I have always strived for a budget that was equitable, that represented my values and the values of the entire council, and that protected the future of our city. Direct this year, as we embark on budget negotiations together one last time, I hope that we can keep these principles in mind and that we can work together towards these common goals, and I'm sure we will. I will now turn it over to Chair Rosenthal for her opening remarks. Thank you very much. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. Um, hang on one second. Here we go. Um, Chair Drum, I echo the comments you just made to Director mm -hmm. Jihad. It's been a pleasure to work with him um, over the last seven and a half years. So thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. I'm chair of the subcommittee on capital budget. In fiscal year 2021, the capitals, uh, the city's capital program endured a uniquely frustrating and yet encouraging year. The first six months of the fiscal year was mired in pandemic related slowdowns and outright pauses of many of the city's capital projects for all for good reason. Um, but by the midpoint of the year, actual capital commitments, uh, while they were extremely low, the city realized that the infrastructure and the economy needed help and um, and and really uh, jump started the capital plan. So uh, the city's economic health received a shot in the arm in the form of 15.2 billion in federal stimulus funding. And this in part allowed the city to restart the capital process with renewed vigor. And we have seen some encouraging signs that these efforts are already paying dividends. Between January and March of this year, the city committed 3.1 billion, which if we had been able to continue at this pace the entire fiscal year, would have nearly put us on track to meet historical high levels of 12.6 billion committed in fiscal year 19. Um, that's a great process for the construction industry, for the city's workforce, and for the residents of the five boroughs who benefit from the city's capital infrastructure in innumerable ways. Uh, as we look forward, as we look ahead to fiscal year 22, the executive capital commitment plan has 21.9 billion in planned commitments before unused appropriations from fiscal 2021 are even reforecast. And while I'm impressed with the city's efforts in the latter half of fiscal year 21, I hope we can keep the momentum going, get back to those uh, fiscal years 2019 levels, um, 21.9 billion commitments in a single year seems unrealistic, but I look forward to being proven wrong and hearing from OMB today about how they plan to make that happen. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chair Drum. Thank you again, Chair Rosenthal. Next, we'll hear a testimony from the Office of Management and Budget. We are joined by Budget Director Jacques Gia and the first Deputy Director, Ken Godden. Before the OMB testimony, I am going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum, and thanks, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, my name is Rebecca Chasen, and I am counsel to the New York, City's, New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Uh, please be aware that there could be a delay in this process, so we appreciate your patience. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on to speak. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the uh, witnesses from the Office of Management and Budget. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Director Jiha? Deputy Director Godner? You. Uh, thank you, Director Jihai. You may begin when ready. Okay. 
Just one moment, I just want to introduce our other council members, Director Gia. So we have council members Lewis, Gibson, Van Bramer, and Ayala. And thank you, uh, Director Gia. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum, uh, Subcommittee Chair Rosenthal, and members of the Finance Committee for the opportunity to testify today concerning the fiscal year 22 executive budget. My name is uh, Jacques Shiha, and I'm the director of the New York City's Mayor's Office of Management and Budget. I'm joined today by OMB First Deputy Director Kenneth Gardner. I'm happy to report today that we are on a path to recovery from the pandemic, and our outlook has significantly improved, largely because of our successful vaccination campaign and the federal stimulus. Moody's Investor Services and S&P agree. Within the past 10 days, they both expressed confidence in our fiscal planning and the city's emerg emergence from um, by raising our geo bond outlook from negative to stable. While the stimulus is a bridge to economic and, and financial recovery, it is important to note that the city is on a path to emerging from the greatest financial, financial stress test he has ever experienced. The fiscal year 21 budget was balanced in April, in June, and again this January, despite substantially reduced resources and without any assistance from the federal or state governments. Fiscal year 22 executive budget was balanced this January and remain now balanced at $98.6 billion. And out year budget gaps are manageable and within historic norms. And we did all of this without layoffs or major disruptions in services. Our cash position has been strong without any short term borrowing and we have met all our financial and pension obligations. This was possible because of the strong measures we took to reduce expenses and headcount. Since June, we generated $3.9 billion in savings. That is net of the restoration we made primarily as a result of the federal stimulus. And we brought down headcount to about 314,000 employees from a peak of 327,000 employees as a result of a strict attrition management initiative. More importantly, <clears throat> the administration, in partnership with the city council, built record levels of reserves before the pandemic, about $6.1 billion, which became available to help balance the budget during the height of our fiscal challenges. Now, because the difficult but necessary decisions were already made and the city's finances were relatively stable, we did not have to dig ourselves out of a massive hole when help arrived. This allows us to invest billions of stimulus dollars across the financial plan that will both improve the economy and improve people's lives. It also allows us to rebuild our reserves by adding $200 million to the general reserve in fiscal year 22 and reversing the withdrawal of $1.6 billion from the retiree health benefit trust that was planned for fiscal year 21. Now, there is $3.8 billion in the retiree health benefit trust, $493 million in the rainy day fund, and $300 million in the general reserve for a total of about $4.6 billion in reserve next fiscal year. And we maintain annual reserves of $1.2 billion between fiscal year 23 and 25 in the general reserve and the capital stabilization reserves. Right now, we are starting to see signs of the recovery across the country and at home. Employment growth across the country has accelerated. As of April, the US economy recovered 63% of the job loss in the downturn. 
and unemployment levels are expected back to pre-pandemic heights by the end of 22. Over the same period, New York City recouped 42% of lost jobs. Between December and April, however, between December and April alone, the city gained back 160,000 jobs, driven by increases in restaurants, hotel, and healthcare. And last month, the unemployment rate declined to 11.4%, down from a pandemic high of 20% in May 2020. As job growth continues, we forecast that city employment will reach 4.5 million by December 2021, which is just 20, 200,000 shy of short of peak uh, employment. Because of this growth, we have revised our tax revenue forecast higher by $1.5 billion over fiscal year 21 and 22 driven by gains in personal and business income taxes. The property tax forecast for fiscal year 22 and beyond remains unchanged. You can actually see a resurgence happening right now throughout the city. Weekday subway ridership is on the rise and restaurant attendance is increasing as occupancy limits are relaxed and the weather improves. The city workforce has returned to the offices. Large private employers like JP Morgan, Citibank, and Goldman Sachs are expected to bring employees back in the summer, with some recently advancing start dates. Baseball stadiums and cultural attractions are ramping up to capacity. Our libraries are reopening, and Broadway turns the lights back on in the fall. As I mentioned earlier, this momentum is propelled by our aggressive vaccination campaign and the federal stimulus. We have administered 7.9 million vaccine doses to date, with 3.4 million New Yorkers fully vaccinated. To which unvaccinated and hesitant populations, we are taking a creative approach our public relations campaign stretches across social media platforms, cable TV, and public transportation. Mobile vaccination buses reach New Yorkers in the traditionally on the served three neighborhoods. Centers and pop-up sites are in unique and interesting places like the Museum of Natural History, City Field, and Yankee Stadium, and now subway stations. We are also partnering with entities like City Bike and Shake Shack to provide incentives. And by now, every New Yorker should know that all centers accept, accept work-ins. Our $700 million vaccination program is a success. COVID-19 cases, hospitalization, <clears throat> infection rates, and deaths have declined steadily since reaching a second wave peak in February. As our vaccination campaign have saved, has saved life, lives and set the stage for the reopening, the shift to democratic control in Washington, D.C. led to a significant change in our financial position. Over the past 13 months, cities and states across the country incurred tremendous costs as the need for services increased with the severity of the pandemic. At the same time, revenue plummeted. To address this problem, the Congress passed and the president signed into law the American Rescue Plan, which includes $350 billion in relief for state and local governments. New York City will receive $5.9 billion in local aid and $7 billion in federal education aid that must be used by calendar year 2024. <clears throat> the local aid will be, dis will be disbursed in two tranches. We received the first tranche last week, and the second will come in about a year. In addition to helping us to recover financially, the allocation of stimulus funding allowed New York State to withdraw proposed budget cuts and shifts and provide 
long-awaited campaign for fiscal equity CFE funding, which will ramp up to about $1.1 billion annually. The council advocacy over many years helped make this happen. Thank you. The stimulus-driven investment in this plan reached the gap to recovery. Speaking broadly, we have used them to boost education, public and mental health, nonprofit support, public safety, and support for small businesses and tourism. We have deepened investment in education because the youngest New Yorkers' success will propel the city's growth for years to come. We are, we, we are using newly released CFE funding to make sure that every one of our schools receives at least 100% of fair student funding beginning in fiscal year 22. Universal free pre-K for all will be available to every family by September 2023. Students have suffered during the pandemic. So we are investing $500 million in fiscal year 22 and $350 million over fiscal year 23 and 24 to accelerate academic opportunities and make up the learning gap caused by the pandemic. We have also funded digital tools that support technology literacy, restorative justice programs, an expansion of the number of community schools from 266 to 406, and have strengthened special education services to address services like physical and speech therapy that could not be delivered during the pandemic. To make sure that students have a fun, safe summer, the administration created Summer Rising a program that will include academic, recreational, and social and emotional learning. We also deepen youth employment opportunity by adding 5,000 CUNY summer youth employment slots, which allows us to serve a total of 75,000 participants. In recognition of the impact the pandemic has had on New Yorkers' emotional well-being, we are adding 25 new mobile teams that will bring mental health services directly to New Yorkers. Also now, EMS and social workers will be able to respond to urgent nonviolent mental health needs citywide. This has been a challenging time for seniors as well. To help them recover, we are expanding 25 more senior centers in underserved communities and increasing model budget funding. We have heard your concern about the funding needs of the city's human services providers, which have been a critical piece of the city's pandemic response. So in this plan, we added funds in the baseline to cover 100% of non-for-profit providers, provider and direct rates. Bringing the cities back includes support for small businesses that have suffered during the pandemic. Beginning this summer, Eligible, eligible small businesses in low to moderate income neighborhoods will have access to a $100 million grant pool to help them bridge the gap to recovery. We are also investing $30 million this year to leverage $70 million in private investment to offer low interest loan to small businesses citywide. The need to socially distance has highlighted the value of expanding public space. <clears throat> in this plan, we are deepening our investment in the open restaurant and streets programs and increasing space for cyclists on boulevards and the Broken Bridge. And of course, we need visitors to return to our hotels, restaurants, and cultural attractions. To help welcome them back, New York City and Company will launch the largest tourism campaign in the city's history. When tourists return, they will find a cleaner city especially in core business districts, thanks to the city's cleanup core, a New Deal style, style program that will employ 10,000 New Yorkers to the end of the year. Little basket collection service has been restored as well. Not only will the city be cleaner, it will be greener. Organics collection, a shared priority for the city council and administration will be resumed beginning this fall. <clears throat> this means three and a half million New Yorkers who previously received service will be able to opt in to the weekly curbside comp composting service. We are also increasing investment in public safety and criminal justice. 
This includes hate crime prevention measures, the Mayor Safe Summer Program for Youth, and doubling of the Q violence workforce this year and tripling it in fiscal year 23. More than $1.8 billion of new investment in this plan are identified as priorities in council preliminary budget response. On top of what I've already noted in my testimony, like fair student funding and increasing the indirect rate, restored college access, college access for all, allocated, allocated funding for small group tutoring, and will ensure that every school has a nurse. On the capital side, we added $94 million to restore funding for the uh, 111, 116%. Before I conclude, I'd like to discuss the capital plan. COVID-19 substantially disrupted the city's capital planning. Though critical life safety needs, health and safety, and COVID-related projects for school reopening were never paused. As of April, all restrictions have been lifted and the process has completely resumed. Despite these challenges, $6.7 billion to April 21 have been committed. March and April commitment were $1.4 billion and $1.3 billion respectively once all the capital contract restrictions were lifted. We continue to work with agencies, the law department and marks so the agencies can commit as much of their 2021 programs as possible in the remaining two months. The 10-year executive capital strategy is $132.7 billion, an increase of $14.9 billion over the preliminary capital plan. We anticipate investing just over $21.9 billion in infrastructure in fiscal year 22 alone. Major additions to the 10-year capital strategy include fully funding affordable housing to your home, your home NYC, resurfacing 1,150 miles of lanes, including 50 miles of bike lanes each year, expanding school capacity for universal 3K, completing the Manhattan Greenway, funding the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, and expanding the Life Side NYC initiative. To conclude, we are on a path to recovery and our outlook has drastically improved. To preserve the momentum, we remain committed, committed to our vaccination program and the strong fiscal management practices that guided our recovery and prevented the need for short-term debt financing, major programmatic, programmatic cuts or layoffs. It has never been more important to build and maintain reserves and make strategic investments that help us grow and prosper. We look forward to working with you as we approach adoption to advance our shared goals, which include rebuilding the city and forging the recovery for all of us. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Now I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much, Director Gia. I just want to start by saying again, what a pleasure it has been to work with you both as the commissioner of uh, the Department of Finance and now as the director of OMB. Um, I just can't thank you enough for your honest, straightforward answers in the past. And I uh, really appreciate this opportunity again to ask you questions about the upcoming uh, budget. <clears throat> Let me start off by just asking a few questions around the federal funding that we've received or will receive. The city's fiscal outlook changed so dramatically between the preliminary and executive budgets this year, in part due to the work of Senator Schumer and the Democrats in Washington, which led to the city receiving about $15 billion in federal relief. The federal funding is allocated throughout the financial plan, and in many cases to long-term programs and initiatives. How will the next administration be able to, to sustain these programs that really should be baselined when the federal funding runs out. Um, thank you again, uh, Chair, and uh, appreciate uh, uh, working with you. It's been also a pleasure for me over the past uh, uh, eight years working with you. To answer your question, I think the best thing uh, we can do uh, for the city, to be quite honest with you, is to leave a strong economy and a solid financial plan 
that includes substantial budget reserves. We have allocated two thirds of the stimulus in fiscal year 21 and 22, when it's most needed for maximum impact to stimulate the economy. And to address your uh, specific concerns with, uh, about the current program, it should be noted that most of the new investment in education and recovery are funded through the financial plan. We have also increased our reserve by $1.8 billion to $4.6 billion. Please remember we inherited only $1.8 billion in reserve. More importantly, a tax revenue forecast tend to be conservative. And if the economy recovers as we anticipate, there would be additional, a lot of additional resources basically to deal with any uh, uh, of these uh, programs. And indeed, uh, both uh, Moody's and S&P upgrade last week, basically confirm the wisdom of our approach. Okay, thank you, uh, Director. The out year uh, budget gaps though are roughly $4 million are large. So how do you expect or think that the next mayor and council would be able to close those gaps um, as we move forward? Um, I clearly understand your concern about out year budget gaps. Um, but remember the city has balanced more than 40 consecutive annual budget uh, during good times and bad times. You know, uh, the current budget gaps from our perspective are manageable and they are within historic norms. Uh, currently the, uh, the, uh, the out year gap that we have in the, uh, in the plan average about 5.2% for some takes the perspective. They average about 5.2% of city's revenue. Over the last 20 years, uh, the out year gap averaged about 7% of our city's revenue. So even in good time, we always have out year budget gaps. I mean, a good example was in 2009, the out year budget gap was average, it was about like 4.7%. So from our perspective, we believe that the gaps are basically manageable, but nonetheless, we'll continue to look for efficiencies, okay? Uh, on the spending and debt service savings. This is why uh, um, um, OMB continues to, we continue to have like a two for one accretion policy in place. Okay. And OMB continues to approve every personal action, including promotion, so that we make sure we continue to look for savings. So if, if you showed a consistent level of spending on the new initiatives that aren't fully funded throughout the plan, how much greater would the out year gaps be? I, 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 can you repeat the question because I missed a part of it? Sure. So if you showed a consistent level of spending on uh, the um, new initiatives that aren't fully funded throughout the plan, how much would that uh, total? How much greater would the out year budget gap be? Uh, actually, as I said, uh, uh, most of the out year, uh, most of the, the new programs are funded uh, mm -hmm. through the financial plan. I mean, some you know, a, a small portion of it. You know, in twenty twenty five, you have a drop off, but uh, it's not significant. It's not a big number. But again, as I said, most of the recovery and educational education initiatives are all funded through the four year the financial financial plan, except for twenty five in year twenty five, where you have a small drop off for some of the programs. Do you have an idea of how much that would be, though? Uh, director? Yeah, I, I could come back to you on a specific number for, for this. Okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> um, the federal aid from the American Rescue Plan Act offers the possibility of a more equitable recovery, but the act is designed for its funding to be spent quickly. So the uh, re rescue plan rules seem to make it harder for the city to use that funding to build reserves to help assure the sustainability of our budget in the future, based on OMB's understanding of the rules, um, the rescue plan uh, money can be used to add to the city's rainy day funds, to prepay expenses, such as debt service or library fund, or add to the retiree plan. Can they be used for those purposes? Yeah, we, there are some limitations in terms of uh, uh, what we can do uh, for uh, in terms of tax reduction, you know, um, but the tax reduction is for the state, but for specifically for us, it deals with uh, putting that point in reserves. 
but uh, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we can use uh, the fund. And that's the reason why we've been basically um, using the fund to make up for all the revenue loss. In other words, every area where we have uh, losses in revenue could use the fund. And you know we have a lot of latitude. So we are very comfortable in terms of, again, with respect, I think the major restriction we have is basically adding it to reserves. Can it be used for the rainy day fund? Uh, I, I don't think it can be used, but again, money is a little fungible. We have been able to reduce a, a lot of our expenses, okay, using federal tax dollars that free up resources that, you know, that give us the flexibility to use those city tax dollars that we free up, okay, to put that, that, that kind of resources either in the rainy day fund or do it, use it for general reserves. Okay, so if we're planning to use the federal funding to support programs that were previously supported by city funds, is there any limitation on the federal uh, American Rescue Plan funds on the use of those free city dollars? So in other words, if you were to free up city dollars and you know replace it with the federal funds, yeah, that's, um, could the freed up city dollars be added to our reserves? That's what we've been doing. Uh, in essence, we've been, uh, you know, able to cover many expenses with stimulus funds, and I've been able to avoid drawing down on existing reserves and, or you know, and that because once we you free up those uh, uh, those uh, uh, city tax dollars, you know, you can use those city tax tax dollars that we free up to basically rebuild our reserves, which is what we've been doing in essence. Okay. Are there any um, eligibility rules that create a problem for our financial plan or any action that uh, the administration that we would seek to change? No, we, uh, we've been uh, diligently implementing, you know, um, the uh, stimulus funding per the guidance uh, um, dictated to us by the federal government. Uh, we have issued guidelines to agencies and we are constantly monitoring uh, those guidelines to make sure that stimulus uses uses uh, stay within the uh, mandated parameters. So so far, as I said, the, the big one is you cannot use it for reserve. But again, we have been uh, uh, creative enough to uh, basically um, use uh, those uh, um, federal uh, stimulus uh, uh, funds to basically. Um, replace uh, city tax dollars and then use uh, city tax dollars basically to do other things. Okay, thank you. Um, the council prioritized class size deduction in its budget response. And when I asked the mayor how the budget prioritized class size deduction, his response was that the administration will first see how the 100% fair funding will be applied by schools in terms of headcount and work from there. But experience has shown that schools often require specific directions and support and dedicated funding to lower class sizes. So I'm a little skeptical that a modest school budget increase will lead to a significant reduction in class sizes. Uh, since the mayor and the chancellor have both expressed support for lowering class sizes, will you commit to uh, dedicating $250 million of the DOE's budget in fiscal 22 for a class size reduction initiative? Yeah, and again, uh, we understand clearly uh, the importance of uh, low, you know, small, small class size in terms of uh, their impact on uh, on outcome, educational outcome. And um, you know, as you know, we um, in the budget uh, we increase uh, the um, first and funding uh, by a hundred, at least hundred percent for all the schools. Uh, from our from our own experience. Uh, school will be able to use these resources as they see fit, and, you know, and very often historically what they've used that funding for is uh, basically to, in to increase their staff capacity, which uh, often translate in terms of, in term in in translate into a uh, reduction of uh, class sizes. Uh, as you know, um, class size is uh, more or less a long term uh, 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 issue, you know, because, uh, but we have been able to expand using capital dollars basically to address capacity. Okay. But again, it's going to take some time to, uh, expand, uh, um, um, those tax dollars basically to bring down, uh, class size. 
But in the meantime, in the short term, what we're trying to do is basically trying to use as much as we can the stimulus funding to address uh, uh, learning losses uh, for uh, students in the short term. But again, we understand uh, your concern, and you know, but this is not something from my perspective we could address right away. Okay, it's going to take some time because you have to build the capacity, you have to expand the capacity of the school. Um, but again, we're doing our best in the short term to address learning losses by using seamless funds. Okay, um, Director Gia, when I did question the mayor, um, he did say uh, at the time that um, you know he wanted to see the fair student funding and how that would uh, affect class size. But yes. he did. When I asked him further about the two hundred and fifty million, he said he couldn't commit to a number right then and there, but that um, he would work with us on that. I hope that we can still continue to work on that and to oh, see uh, dedicated funding in this budget uh, moving forward. Is that something De that you can commit to with us? We will okay, definitely work you. with you. We'll definitely work with you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Gia. Um, at the preliminary budget hearing, you testified that your staff would reach out to the council with a property tax rebate proposal prior to the administration going up to Albany to lobby for legislation. Um, but we haven't heard anything yet. So is the mayor still seeking a property tax rebate in legislation in Albany? And if so, is there draft legislation that has been shown to state legislators? Uh, we are still in active uh, discussion on this with the state legislature and we'll keep you posted as far as, you know, in terms of the progress that we're making. Uh, the legislature is still in session uh, and as the session near to an end, we would welcome a uh, discussion with you on the parameters for home relief and how to, you know, the best way to target uh, that program. But again, we're still in discussion with Albany and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the session is still going on and uh, we wouldn't see what's going to happen in Albany. Have uh, the um, legislators that you've approached so far been supportive of the legislation? Uh, yes, to some extent, but it's just a question of, uh, you know, uh, whether or not it's uh, a priority of, of theirs, but we, you know, we, we're doing our best to push as, as much as we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, New York State recently extended the eviction moratorium until August 31, 21, and it's expected that the state will start distributing over $2 billion in rental assistance to tenants that will cover up to a year's worth of unpaid rent and utilities to keep them housed after the moratorium is lifted. In contrast, DSS's fiscal 22 budget does not make additional investments in rental arrears or increases to rental assistance vouchers to address post eviction moratorium impact to the city. Aside from funding the full expansion of the city's access to council program in DSS, what resources are currently in the budget across all city agencies to keep New Yorkers in their homes once the moratorium is lifted? So there's not an influx of people seeking shelter if they are in fact evicted. Mm -hmm. As you know, um, we added about $1.9 billion in capital. This is a uh, city funds and the executive budget to fully fund the housing uh, New York uh, 2.0 plan. Uh, we also added $15 million to fully fund our first in the nation right to council program which is uh, funded uh, right now about $166 million as you know, as it fully ramps up in 22. Uh, the state is implementing uh, the uh, $2.4 billion in uh, rental areas assistance uh, program that they receive from the federal government. We are actively in conversation with uh, OTDA on the implementation of this program. And we will be diligently working to connect New Yorkers to this funding. Commissioner, what's your estimate of the number of households? I mean, Director, I'm sorry. What is your estimate of the number of households that the state funding will assist compared to the number of households in New York City that are behind with rental payments? Uh, I think we will. Let me get back to you because let me speak with DSS and get back to you on the specific number. Um, because uh, as the uh, the details have been rolled out, again, we are very excited to see the state and federal government put funding into this program, but we'll get back to you on the specific uh, uh, numbers of New Yorkers who will participate in that program. Has, uh, oh, thank you. Has OMB conducted an analysis on raising rental vouchers to Section 8 rates in terms of how many more families 
would be diverted uh, and move out of shelter and what the savings would be on the shelter budget? Um, uh, as we said before, you know, you know, the ways in the city's voucher level must, you know, be consistent with the state uh, uh, FEPS level, because otherwise, you know, we uh, the voucher market will become destabilized. But uh, uh, so let me let uh, Ken uh, Gardner, who's been working on this uh, more, provide you uh, some answer to a specific question. Oh, thank you. So. Uh, First, we want to, you know, thank you for your advocacy on this so far, and uh, you know, we really uh, are prevailing upon you to to continue to do so and partner with us in advocating uh, for state action before the end of session. Uh, we, uh, you know, we believe that that in order to make uh, this effect most effective, uh, we need the state to raise their vouchers. So that we have a single level of of payment as opposed to money simply shifting from one type of from city uh from state to city um we are uh, you know interested in in trying to get that done we would we would ask the council uh to work with us in albany to try to get that uh single rate across the the state fixed um and you know the in terms of this program you know i know that that that, that people feel like the voucher level is low, we would want to point out, right, that there are currently over 160,000 individual placements covering 63,000 uh, households. So the, the, the current vouchers are working uh, and, and there are a very large number of people uh, taking advantage of that. I believe you're muted, Chair Drum. Oops, I just lost my question here. All right, so that um, Housing New York 2.0 uh, plan, it doesn't address the uh, immediate influx of evictions that may happen under the moratorium if, it, if, it's, under, if it's lifted. Um, is there anything else additional that um, we can count on? Well, the, the state recently... Uh, and that's, by the extended. way, that's a plan, I think. I'm sorry, say again? And that's a 10 year plan, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. the, the state recently uh, extended the, the moratorium, uh, I believe, till the end of August. Um, and we've made uh, substantial investments in this area, including uh, 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 capital expenditures to increase the, the level of, uh, uh, of, of, of affordable housing. We've also expanded our access to council model, funding that at 100%. Um, you know, there's uh, additional state money that that Director Shia talked about uh, that's going to be used to to pay for rent arrears. Uh, we think that covers 12 months of rent arrears plus three months of current rent. So we think the combined uh, effect of those those programs should uh, avoid some kind of a uh, of a mass eviction crisis. Okay, I still worry uh, that uh, we're going to see a huge influx. Um, but uh, anyway, at this point, I I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, to Chair Rosenthal, to ask questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Drum. I too am just finding my place. Um, I just wanted to follow up very quickly on a question the chair asked about vouchers. I was a little thrown off um, by something that was said. The chair asked about uh, the importance or the cost of increasing the value of the city FEPS program to Section 8 levels. And I I think the answer was that there are already 100,000 vouchers out there. Did I hear? I, I'm sorry. So I, I'm 63,000 households covering 160,000 New yes. Yorkers. Yes, yes. Uh, but those are not city FEPS vouchers, are they? I believe they are, yes. Okay. Uh, I'll let my colleagues 
follow up on that. Um, switching over to the capital restart and the commitment rates. As we all know, the mayor announced the restart of significant tranche of capital projects that were delayed due to COVID back in March. And since then, the city, and kudos to you, uh, Director Jiha, the city has been very successful in its efforts to get projects off the ground as evidenced by increasing the commitment rate. By December of 2020, the city had committed 2.3 billion in capital dollars in fiscal year 21. But since January, um, you've committed 3 billion more for a total of 5.44 billion through March. That's amazing and an amazing pickup in pace. Um, as I mentioned in my opener, although I think I explained it badly, uh, fiscal year 2020, the city um, had committed 8.06 uh, billion. At the pace we're going, do you think we can exceed that in fiscal year 2021? Do you think that we could get up to nine or 10 billion? And, and frankly, what do you think the city's overall commitment level will be? Uh, for fiscal year 2021 by the end of the year. Okay, as I indicated to you in my testimony, uh, as of the end of April, we had $6.7 billion. Okay, we've committed $6.7 billion. Got it, another I, I, yeah. Okay, so again, I, I cannot guarantee where we're gonna end. What I know for sure we're doing is we're pushing as hard as we can. And at the pace that we're going, probably if we, you know, we could exceed uh, uh, last year, okay. All right. Again, we're trying our best. We're pushing really hard. We're pushing the law department, the agencies, marks, working with them. Again, as I said, if you have any suggestion in terms of how we could do even better, mm -hmm. uh, we will work on them, okay. But we're doing as 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 best. And I, I, again, as, as I said, I do not want to give you a specific number saying, you know, what is going to be eight, nine. I I, I can't. Anything that we're trying to do right now is to push as hard as we can and try to overcome every single obstacle in our way. Because as I said to you last time, uh, we believe the capital program is a strategic uh, a part yeah. of the recovery. Okay. And uh, with, uh, you know, so therefore we don't have any incentive whatsoever to slow things down. Our goal is basically to accelerate uh, that process to make sure that. Uh, 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 you know, capital is invested and that, that the recovery is full in, is in full swing. So it's part of our strategic investment to speed up the recovery in New York City. So we're doing as best as we can. As I said, we're pushing, we're going at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, no, and, <laughs> and that you, you, you have been. Um, yeah, and now you're at 6 billion, that's amazing. Um, so that segues perfectly into my second set of questions, which is, um, given that commitments have increased at such a rapid pace, um, it's obvious things have changed, either by way of messaging from City Hall, um, in increased coordination and communication within the agencies, uh, as you said, between the agencies and OMB, streamlining the process, um, perhaps all of that. So. Um, and you know where I'm going with this. So what factors do you think have contributed to the city's ability to achieve um, the high rates of commitment since January? And how can we keep those going? Well, it is uh, one day's urgency, okay, to get things out. I mean, the message is I sent to everyone, we gotta get things uh, out because as I said, it's part of the strategic initiative that we have in place to make sure we invest as much as we can to stimulate, to jumpstart this, this economy. So that's the first thing, there's an urgency. Second thing that, that we have done is uh, change the process because one of the, it, it, before what we used, what used to happen, they used to send CPs to uh, OMB, OMB give you the CPs, send a ton of questions to the agencies and then the agencies uh, you know, take their time and to answer every single one of the questions to come back to OMB, okay? So we streamline that process. Now, you know, when things come to OMB, we say, you know what, you gotta provide us all the backup information that we need. Okay. Don't 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 send something that is incomplete. Send it a full complete package. Once you send the full complete package, we're gonna review it as quick as possible and get it done. And yeah. that has worked. 
okay, that as well in terms of uh, the process. But again, we'll continue to work with uh, every single one involved in the process to make sure that at some point we fully re-engineer uh, uh, the entire process. Exactly. Because we have to, you know, we have to re-engineer the entire process. Again, sometimes, you know, the back and forth takes a long time. So again, as I said, once uh, that budget process is over and we have a little more time to start thinking about things during the summer, this is a piece that we're going to focus our attention on to make sure we revamp the entire process. We engineer the entire process from beginning to end, okay, to continue to make more progress. Wow, that's a big one. Um, and, and that's helpful to know. So basically telling the agencies you have to send over the entire project. We're not going to accept it piecemeal. So sort of thing, you have to send everything over and you have to send it over now. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, let me ask you, um, DDC mentioned some changes in their process and rules. And I'm, I'm zeroing in on them just because they're such an important part of the capital commitment um, mm -hmm. process. I'm wondering if um, they, they made some changes in the rules and in their processes during the pandemic. They were able to do that because it was an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, are you looking at those and thinking about whether or not to codify those changes and what you would need to do to do that? Uh, again, we will be working with everyone, including the, you know, including the DC, to make sure that we learn from them. Okay, we learn best practices from them, and, and then uh, try to, uh, you know, it, it's again we have so many constraints around in okay. terms of things that we cannot do, things you cannot do, things that have to be given you by every single one, so certain uh, uh, um, um, monitors to make sure everything fits within the box. So again, this is one of those things that we have to basically open up the hood, okay? Look look under the hood and see what's going on. And uh, you know, and that's what we intend to do this summer. So okay. we'll get, definitely get DDC involved. Uh, again, learn from them, learn from every other agency, learn from the practices, you know, particularly learn from the emergency contracting process, yeah. because I always believe if you build something around the emergency contracting process and then yeah. put all the constraints around those, it's better than revamping it from scratch because everybody's going to tell you why they need to be involved in the monitoring process. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I would really urge you to meet with them sure. um, somewhat regularly and sure. bring sort of the state sure. We've been the panel team um, because I think they have a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. uh, very specific changes. And uh, I think OMB could play a big role in that. Um, in fact, how frequently do you have infrastructure meetings with the agencies, um, especially with the large, uh, the agencies with the large capital portfolios regarding that. A tax force meet with them, like, you know, they meet with every other agencies. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, which, oh, you mean the task force for each? At agency? OMB, yes, you know, the cap, you know, they meet but with that's them. That's usual stuff. I mean, that's the usual, that's the usual, but, but as I said, for you as the director. As I said, this is this is something that, as I said, we will, you know, in the summer, we will begin to, you know, look at everything from to nuts and to make sure that, uh, you know, we uh, spend time uh, redesigning the process that we have in place, okay? Um, you know, I, I can't meet every single agency, you know, on a weekly basis. That's the reason why we have tax force designed to basically to meet with all sure. agencies because you know my, you know my time is very scarce as well as everybody else, but uh, we have a capital coordination uh, uh, tax force that you know that meets with the agencies uh, regularly. Okay, so we have a, you know we have a tax force basically it's a coordination tax force that we have in place, you know a capital coordination tax force that we have in the, uh, in, uh, in the agency that meet uh, with all the other agencies. But as I said. As part of the review process, uh, we will meet with every single one of the agencies, look at the processes, yeah, okay? sure. look at the processes as is, forward. Okay? Yeah. And, and, and then look at the processes as it should be, go as it should be going forward. Yeah, so we would get everyone involved and do designing that process. So um, the one thing that you just said that I think I might not have been aware of is, did you say there was a capital coordinating task force? It's a unit. It's a unit within 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 OMB. 
that covers all the agencies or are you talking again unit by unit no it could co basically coordinate with you know coordinate with all the agencies coordinate with with the tax force within the, the, the within the agency within omb and then work with the different agencies is they meet regularly you know but as i said it's going to be we our goal is to make it a more of a formal process okay as we move forward this summer and uh you know to uh basically review all the best practices yeah. and guidelines. Sure, sure. But um, I'm just wondering because you're, again, we're in perfect sync. I appreciate the way you're talking about this. Um, I'm moving on to the capital tracker um, system, the local law that was passed by the council. Is that the task force you're talking about? That task force? Because that one, I don't think has met yet. You seem to be talking about something that's a coordinating task force. With it's, a co it's, a, it's, a, it's a coordinating unit it. within, within a capital coordinating all unit. All the deputies or? They like, meet with all the task force within OMB and then regularly meet with the agencies again to see, you know, to review the practices, to try to implement best practices as much as possible to reduce uh, uh, the time that it takes Okay. To uh, to the process, yes. Got it. And so, just uh, so I can pursue it and understand it a little better, we can do all this offline. I'm just wondering who heads that up. Uh, it's uh, uh, Serena Young. Serena Young. But again, Serena Young uh, heads up the uh, unit. But again, uh, you know, we could always uh, meet with you to brief you further if you need uh, more. Ah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'd love to follow yeah. up with that person. I'm actually not familiar, sure. so I'd love, love, love to follow up. And yeah. thank you, thank you for that. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, uh, okay, so let me just sort of go into that. So last year, the council passed Local Law 37 sponsored by Council Member Lander, who I see is on here, and I'm sure we'll ask you follow-up questions. It mandated the creation of a citywide capital projects database. Um, and the law created a mayoral task force to lead the work and an advisory board with the council, controller, mayor, uh, and the mayor's some mayoral appointees to provide feedback and um, guidance. Uh, Council Member Lander and I have been appointed by the speaker to that advisory board. Um, you know, and the advisory board that was set up is not novel. This actually was originally uh, uh, moved along by finance chair uh, in the in the in the previous um, uh, four years, uh, Julissa Ferris Copeland and. Um, I, I went to those meetings. They were extraordinary. Um, just seeing, you know, uh, agency commissioners hear from Mox directly about the system and <clears throat> seeing their faces, it was like a light bulb went off. You know, they were like, oh, so you mean if we do it this other way, it could happen faster? I mean, I think that's the power of this. Um, task force or advisory board. So um, I'm wondering if you could just give an update on the administration and the mayor's task force work to get started on that tracker creation. Have you had internal meetings um, or started any discussions? And when do you would anticipate meeting with the advisory board? I think Council staff was told the first week of June would be the meetings, um, but we haven't anything on the calendar yet. Yeah, I mean, again, as I said, uh, it's uh, this is a kind of process that is always good to uh, basically, because I always tell folks, when people begin to review the current processes and see how challenging how challenge the processes are and all the challenges that they have is because of all the obstacles they put in the way themselves, okay? And so it's always good to have this kind of a place where people can meet so we could review existing processes and uh, make suggestions in terms of uh, how best to improve them going forward. Again, this is something that um, I'm looking forward to work with the council this summer, okay? 
uh, it's going to be a prior, as I said, that the entire process, capital uh, uh, review process is something that I'm looking to work with the council this summer, because this is something that we'd like to review. Uh, so uh, again, I'm looking to work uh, with you and, uh, and, uh, and the council members and all the stakeholders after the budget. Okay, because that would give us some time. Yeah, that would give us yeah. some time to really right. think through the big issues. Yeah. You know, because you know we're going through the crisis in the budget now. It's like of you know, of <laughs> it's. Just, I'm with you. So yeah, after yeah. the budget process is completed, okay. we will we'll look forward to work with you. Got it. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Two more areas. I just want to move it along. I know my colleagues have questions. Um, on the ten-year capital strategy. So the 10-year capital strategy, as you mentioned, it grew by nearly 15 billion since the release of the draft 10-year strategy, largely driven by increases in schools, as you mentioned, water infrastructure and transportation. Um, but despite the growth, um, we continue to see that in the first five years of the strategy, um, uh, track of the commitment plan, um, it, it hasn't changed that much, but the final five years, really that's where it jumps. Um, so I'm sort of asking the same question we've asked for years, but I'm wondering whether or not the administration has taken the time to, has figured out how to even that out? In other words, are you tracking your larger strategy with um, your your spending or your projected spending in the in the capital plan? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, again, this is an exercise we're going to work for uh, with the September in September with the uh, the capital because we're going to do a redistribution, okay? Over you know over the, you know to see exactly after you know to uh, uh, to smooth things out, okay? Because as you can imagine, uh, the capital is uh, basically overstated. Commitment rate has been very, you know, much lower than, uh, you know. So therefore, uh, it, it behooves us, okay, to go through that exercise to align the capital plan with more or less the historical uh, commitment rates that we have. So this is an exercise we're going to go through again after the executive budget you know, as part of the September uh, release. Okay, to do a redistribution, and the uh, good thing about this is also going to put uh, uh, create some uh, give us uh, the benefit of lowering the debt service in the out years of the financial plan yeah. because you know there will be less capital. But again, this is an, you know this is something that we're going to go through uh, after the uh, executive budget, after the adopted budget. The budget is adopted in June. Mm, okay. As part of the September. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to have summer off. So, <laughs> no, I'm no, no, we're gonna keep you very busy. We're gonna keep you very busy. This is Good. this is gonna be fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm done with that. Uh and then just quickly about NYCHA, they historically had such a low commitment rate of city capital dollars against the commitment plan. Um and uh interestingly, what we learned at the hearing with them is that I mean we all know NYCHA spends its federal dollars at a much higher rate um, because the federal funding expires after two years. So they really have to, you know, get on it and spend that money or else they're going to lose it. Um, and with the city capital, of course, we have no time limit. The NYCHA chair testified that if the city funding rules, uh, this was Greg Ross, uh, were more closely matched to the federal funding rules, then NYCHA would spend city capital more efficiently. Um, I was surprised to hear him say that. Um, he seemed to be saying, well, there's a, just such a big disconnect between what the rules are for federal spending and city spending, he seemed to be throwing up his hands and saying, let's just go with the federal rules. Um, you know, and, and to give context about why this is so important, 
I forget the number for federal spending. It, it was very high, maybe over 70%. Folks can correct me or, or send over the right numbers. But for federal, the commitment rate was some, over 70. And for the city, it was 5%. Um, it's such a stunning difference and um, certainly has played out in my experience for, for money that I've put in uh, to the NYCHA plan. So has OMB considered putting a time limit on city capital funding for NYCHA? Uh, no, um, we again, as I said, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're going to have to find ways for NYCHA, NYCHA to accelerate uh the piece of uh, capital uh spending but uh we have not this is one of those things that uh, we have to uh leave you analyze because i don't know full ramifications of what it means so therefore i can't i cannot Me neither. <laughs> so we cannot... this is part of i'm really <laughs> interested to hear you say that because Russ seemed to imply that he had been working very closely with OMB on this. And so for me, um, again, it sounds like there's a real disconnect here. Um, has OMB considered asking the state for the ability to alter the city capital rules for NYCHA? As I said, uh, we, have, we have not. It's been done with SCA. As I said, we have not because we have not. This is not something that we have paid attention to in the past. So, you know, the fact that he brought it, you know, is raising that issue. You know, we're going to have to take a look at it to see whether or not, you know, putting certain restriction would uh, allow NYCHA to commit capital sooner. But again, as I said, I don't know the full ramification of it. So therefore, I don't want to make a commitment one way or another. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I don't I, know I what think, it means. OK, I what do you want to say, of, Ken? Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I think part of this is that what they're, the, in terms of what they're, you know, they're talking about uh, is that they would, you know, the federal rules for capital eligibility are different than the city rules. That's right. And, you know, we we can't change those rules um, uh, under um, under our gap accounting, right? So we don't really have a choice about about how to record it. It no, makes it, it does it makes it harder. Fewer things are eligible, right? Fewer things are eligible. Stuff yeah. that we might pay for might winds up being expense rather than capital because it's not city eligible. Um, and and I agree that there's a disparity and something we should fix. Uh, and I, you know, obviously we're, you know, as Jacques said, we're trying to accelerate NYCHA, but but you know the 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 extraordinarily low commitment rate is really a COVID sort of level. Mm, I mean, the, I'm, the, I'm not the, sure about that. In, in twenty in 2019, we uh, they committed about 25 percent. I'm still a very low number, but but clearly yeah. not not far. And, and, and that wasn't just an aberration in, in, in 18 to 20. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. I mean, they, there's no question we need to work yeah. on this. I think they need to work on this. But I just wanted to clarify it's it's still, uh, you know, it's still too low. We need to accelerate. Um, I don't think we can fix what, what, what they were talking about, which is that, you know, we could change what, what's capitally eligible. Yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, confident that's sort of what's going on, having just had a terrific capital project denied by OMB as being not capitally eligible. Um, so I think I think they they follow some. I, I'm I'm not. I would like to see evidence of sort of what you're saying there. Look, I'm going to wrap it up, but I I just want to point out that um, you know. Uh, I, during my tenure uh, on, on, on the city council, um, you know, the um, NYCHA's excuse has always been, we've been shortchanged, you know, and it's gone up over the years since I've been here from 32 to 42 billion now. They're saying that they're shortchanged and that's why it's so hard. I'm, I'm not sure that's, I mean, surely that plays into it, but if their commitment rate is 25%, I think that is something that would make a hell of a big difference uh, if that went up to 100%, particularly for 
the city funded projects, in other words, the ones that council members on the ground, you know, who know their districts best, they're trying to get done and, and gosh, for um, NYCHA um, Central, the people we work, they're, they're doing, you know, they talk about, and the mayor's talked about, you know, adding funding for NYCHA to fix things. Um, but it rings a little bit hollow if the commitment rate is 25%. Uh, I'll let other council members get into that and I'll let my um, colleagues move forward with that and, and pass it back to you, Chair Drum. Um, Director Jiha and um, Gardner, I just want you to know, I appreciate, I, I really want to emphasize, emphasize this. You're under tremendous um, uh, pressure and I think what you've done in the last six months has been extraordinary. Um, to go from sort of a, a zero to, you know, 180 or 100, uh, I do believe in speed limits, um, you know, really has been impressive. And you're, you know, what you've done by getting the change, you know, from, from the rating agencies recently, you know, that's huge. So kudos for all of that. But, um, and I get it, I guess, uh, um, about punting to this summer, you know, when you have a moment to catch your breath after putting out all these fires, like I totally get that, but, um, I really hope we can continue the pace for the sake of the city of what you've done over the last few months. And, um, you know, uh, so I, I won't go on. Thank you for your efforts. There's a lot of work to do. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'll go to council for questions. If there are any council members who have questions for OMB, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers, and wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. Uh, the Sergeant will also let you know when your time is up. Uh, we will first hear from Council Member Grudenchik, followed by Council Member Chin. Starting time. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Thank you, chairs and uh, commissioner. It's always good to see you. And I'll echo um, what my uh, colleagues, the chair uh, Drum and Chair Rosenthal said. It's been a pleasure to work with you uh, for me for these past five and a half years. I do just want to um, reiterate um, what Chair Drum said at the beginning of uh, his remarks uh, regarding uh, food. Uh, uh, insecurity food, food pantry food. And, you know, we have come a long way. Um, the New York Times today had a very poignant article about one family struggle um, to make ends meet during this pandemic, losing their apartment, regaining it, um, losing work. Um, and how important uh, food pantries and other uh, meals that were accessible to her and her family uh, played such an important role. So I, I don't have any questions for you, but I, I do want to reiterate uh, Chair Drum's concerns. I know they're shared by Chair Rosenthal and really all the members of this, of uh, the council, uh, without exception, um, about making more food available for uh, more funds available for emergency food, uh, for food pantry food and to make sure that in this great city of ours where literally um, you know a, a budget approaching a hundred billion dollars uh, nobody should go hungry and uh, I know that the mayor and his administration share those concerns uh, I know his politics I don't know your politics so much but that's okay because <laughs> I'm an elected official but um, but it's critical and I, I feel compelled to raise my voice because um, I speak for people that can't speak necessarily to a wide audience by themselves. And uh, I just wanna reiterate that message this morning. I'm not gonna take five minutes to do it, um, but I thank uh, Chair Drum especially. Uh, he has been a stalwart on this, the, the uh, speaker 
and the chair of the General Welfare Committee, um, Steve Levin, who has also been uh, my partner in making sure New Yorkers get fed. So with that, uh, no response necessary, Commissioner, but um, please carry that message back uh, to the mayor um, and we will continue to uh, pound it on our site. Thank you, Chairs. Well, we share, we share your, uh, your concern and uh, I will take the message back to the mayor and, uh, and you know his position on this. It will, uh, it, we have spent significant amount of money on emergency food and we'll continue to do so. Okay, I know his Thank position, you. but you know, as they say, show me the money. Um, <laughs> show me the money. Um, um, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I will now hear from Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Lander. Starting time. Great. Uh, thank you to both chairs and uh, thank you, Director Jihad. It's been a pleasure. Um, sure. This is also my last budget. And I think for the budget for the Department for the Aging, we wanted to go over half a percent of the city's budget. Um, it's always been under half a percent. On this year, let, let's, let's go above that um, because of the growing numbers of you know, senior population. It's gonna be more seniors uh, than, kids, uh, under, than uh, kids under 13. So I think we, we really need to invest in this um, growing population. I know that in your testimony, you talked about um, the investment in terms of 25 new centers in Newark and the model budget. Finally, uh, got back in there. We appreciate that. Uh, but as I, you know what I'm gonna say, it's not enough. Um, there were also um, needs that was raised by the council's uh, preliminary budget response that was not um, taken care of. Um, I know the chair, uh, Chair Drum mentioned it earlier, which is the home delivered meal. We're asking for 16.6 .6 million. Um, there's been a growing number of homebound seniors that need the service and the Get Food program is not enough. Uh, to help them. And so I hope that this money will be added into the final adopted budget. The other issue is on, I know that the mayor, you know, added mental health service to every school or um, school building to really take care of our young people. But let's not forget about our older adults that really suffered through this pandemic. And, you know, what had a toll has been on them in terms of their mental health wellness. So I think that we do need to add more funding into mental health service for our adult, uh, older population to be included um, in every single senior centers in Newark. And I think that is uh, one of the critical needs. Uh, the other thing that wasn't addressed in the DIFTA budget was the new need of technology. We know that a lot of senior had to use virtual program, that was the way they connected um, to staff and to their friends, but not every senior had the hardware or the um, internet access. And we wanna make sure that every seniors that needs it will have it. Um, so the new needs in terms of technology, uh, mental health services, that has not been addressed. Um, the also, the other issue is that in terms of the capital, I just wanna make sure that seniors um, building is on track um, because of the, the pause and also because of uh, personnel shortage, I think at HVD. I wanna make sure that there is enough staff uh, to keep the, uh, the Sarah program for seniors uh, running and making sure that we have uh, you know, you know, capital project are in place so that the number of senior housing you know, don't get fallen back. So I, I think that that is also uh, very critical. And my last question is opening up senior center. Uh, in the DIFTA's budget, I was surprised to see there was $30 million accrual. And I wanna make sure that that money goes back to the senior centers and we have to get the centers open as quickly as possible. Of course, we wanna open them safely. I know that some centers started to grab and go, but that's not enough. 
every senior is waiting for their beloved senior center to be open. Schools are open, Broadway shows are coming back, libraries are open, but what happened to our senior center? So we wanna make sure that the provider have the resources so they can start opening up back the senior center uh, for our seniors because they have been waiting, waiting for a long time. Well, thank you. You always advocate for your for the seniors, <laughs> and it's a lot to uh, uh, a lot of questions here. But again, uh, bottom line is I'm looking forward to work with you, to working with you um, during the, adop the adoption process, so that uh, areas that that you mentioned that you believe we all believe that should be uh, funded, we will review them working with you, and uh, see what can be done. Uh, during the adoption process, because every single one, it's hard to say that uh, you know uh, all the requests that you just uh, laid out, they all are right. They all are you know they all are urgent things. They all are things that we need to pay attention to. Again, as I said, this is a question of uh, resources and all the needs that we have to deal with. But I'm again, inspired. as part of the adoption budget process, we will discuss with you and see what can be done. Well. Thank you, uh, Director Jihad. I'm looking forward to working with you. But okay. most importantly, I think it will meet the needs if we get the DIFTA's budget over the half percent mark. I think that will at least help accomplish with this shit. Okay. We did, I so think, we'll I think work we did on that. very well by the seniors in this budget. <laughs> well, you know, it's so much money, but the commitment is not enough because the population is growing and the budget's got to be more I know, I know, I know. Than, you know, than half a percent. <laughs> it's a shame that it's under half a percent. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I uh, will now hear from just, Council. Just Member. before we move on. Go ahead. Council, just before we move on, may I say that we've enjoyed the Council Member's time with the dollar BS. Thank you. Thanks, Chair Drum. I uh, will now hear from Council Member Lander. Starting time. Thank you very much to Chairs Drum and Rosenthal and Director Jiha. Let me just extend my gratitude to you for your work through this pandemic and to your whole team. We have really relied on you and deeply appreciated it. Um, I want to follow up uh, on Chair Rosenthal's questions about uh, capital projects tracking and then ask some questions about uh, tracking the COVID spending as well. So I just, uh, I understand and I think it makes sense to wait for the first meeting of the capital projects uh, management task force until after the budget, obviously it's a lot to do to get there. But I just, in terms of um, expectation setting, it sounds, I guess, from what you're saying, like there hasn't yet been much work done uh, to start getting the tracker ready. And look, that law went into effect March 13th, 2020. So a lot has happened since then. And I, you know, if the answer is, we really just put it on hold. We not only have we not had the meeting of the task force, but we haven't started doing the work to develop the tracker. I, I understand it, but it'll be easier to go into that. I mean, you know, that would be unfortunate because we need capital projects to deliver better for us right at this moment. But I would understand it. So I, I just is that what I you know what I understand from your answer. Uh, we've been meeting internally. Uh, there's been meeting internally with uh, uh, you know um, with uh, our folks. Uh, but again, at this point, there's no deadline on this, but we, as I said, we're going to try to accelerate that process after the budget, because as I said, you know, we would just went from crisis to crisis. I mean, I mean, you can imagine how difficult it was. Okay. Not a, I understand <laughs> uh, totally. I, this is why I'm just yeah. asking to get an explanation set. I hear you. I understand. Yeah. So, but again, as I said, uh, after the uh, budget is adopted, uh, we will focus our attention on the capital aspect. Okay. So a lot of things, uh, tracking, a lot of things that we'll be doing to continue to monitor, to make sure that things are done properly. Yeah. So again, right. we'll convene a meeting with I, all the stakeholders really in the council. So, and, and look, you know, a challenge with getting capital projects management improved yeah. is that it almost always falls below other urgent things. And obviously the last year COVID- And also, you know, there was a pause that, you know, there was a pause in the capital program as well. So therefore, you know, now that we started, so we'll basically right. uh, try to, again, as I said, this summer, we will My, take a meeting mm, of all the stakeholders and come okay. back to you. Thank you. My second area of questioning though, uh, relates to the spending tracking for COVID spending. 
um, because last year the council passed intro 1952, which became local law 76 of 2020 that we passed in June, sponsored uh, by uh, Councilmember Gibson, who was then the chair of this committee. Uh, and the language there was modeled on the Sandy tracker um, that the Bloomberg administration did in the wake of, of Superstorm Sandy. Um, so the same language was used, but we don't have the same tracking system. Uh, for Sandy, there's a very robust interactive tracking system that New Yorkers can use, can look up projects. And all we have on COVID response is kind of a data dump in the open data portal that no average New Yorker could use, could see projects, could understand how the funding was spent. Um, they're very different from each other. So uh, do you believe the administration is complying with Local Law 76 of 2020? Do you plan to put up a more robust and interactive public tracker to really make sure New Yorkers can understand where that spending is going? Um, <coughs> yes, um, uh, to, be, um, to be quite honest with you, I, we, I believe that we are fully compliant with the law. That's not the issue. The challenge that we have is, um, uh, with respect to some of the data that uh, we need, some of the information that we need to put on our site is not as cut and dry and cannot be provided as easily, okay, as uh, as you can th think of. Because if a uh, good example is reimbursement, okay, the reimbursement based grants, okay, they still require an application and a review, you know, review process by the federal government, okay, be before any cost can be uh, uh, submitted for reimbursement. So, so, so you will not be able to see that kind of information on the portal because they're going through uh, the exercise of reviewing it. But again, I'm a fan of big fan of transparency. So therefore, even though the information that we provided to you, you know, we have you compared, we work. The, have you compared the Sandy tracker to what no. you guys are currently dumping yeah. in the open data portal? This is we, we no have one, to find a way to make not, it more, no, we have to find a way to make it more accessible to the public. Okay, definitely. You're committing to find a way to make it more accessible? More, more accessible to the public. Okay, yeah. when when will we see that? Uh, again, we have to work We have to work on a website, on a website, a website development. We, we have to work on a number of things. At this point in time, I cannot give you a specific date. But again, as I said, for the sake of transparency, we definitely have to make it more easily accessible to the public. Time so expired. I appreciate your recognizing that something uh, different is needed. I guess I would just invite colleagues to compare the Sandy tracker to what we have sure. in the data portal. Director, thank you for acknowledging that. Let's move quickly to do it. Obviously, time is of the essence. Definitely. Thank you. Chair Drum. No okay, other... thank you. Oh, go ahead. No other council members have their hands raised at this time. I, I do see Council Member Donald Diaz. Oh, indeed. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Diaz, we'll now hear from you. Starting time. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. I, COVID testing, my curiosity is to organizations that have been contracted to provide services for, for testing. To um, Has their funds been released? Or could you share with me what, what the process is once an organization is accepted to participate in your process? Um, do you have any specific organization in mind? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what the question is. My, my is question they're not getting is paid? Are they not getting paid? What are they not getting, well, I, and I have eight individuals that reached out to me indicating that they worked and their checks have bounced. So I'm wondering if it's, what the situation is. Is it a matter of New York City? We're having issues making our payments or if it's organizations um, not being as honest as we would have liked them to have been? Uh, it would be, uh, uh, I don't want to comment on, uh, you know, specific uh, cases. It would be uh, uh, very uh, uh, useful for us, helpful for us, if we could get uh, 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 the information uh, about these uh, specific organizations. So what I'll do is I'll have uh, Ivan Costa, which is uh, uh, the uh, Intergov director at OMB, reach out to your office and get the specific information about those uh, but we've been paying uh, our, our providers. New York City checks uh, will not be bounced. <laughs> so, so there's got to be something else going on. So uh, why don't we get the information? And then I, I'm, I'm more than willing to share with you as, as it's been shared with me. Yes, I just want to make sure that you know, the city is, 
is you know do, doing the process and that those that have been blessed yeah. and highly favored to have been contracted to also pay the people correctly. Yes. Thank you and look forward to hearing from you and Ivan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Council Member Levin now has the question. Welcome. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Director Jiha, nice to see you. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions. First, um, uh, Intro 146 is the, the bill that uh, I'm sponsoring to increase the city FEPS voucher rate to Section 8 level. Um, does OMB have a, a, a cost estimate that they can uh, share with Council Finance? Of course. Yes. Okay. Um, and yeah, and 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 um, I think just in in terms of um, understanding the methodology and, and projection, um, that would be helpful. Oh, that would be glad to sit uh, down with you and your staff and uh, the finance uh, council staff to go over the methodology that we use and uh, the uh, estimate that we come up with. Okay. Thank you. Um, second uh, issue. Um, uh, Fair Futures, which is a uh, ACS program that provides um, coaches for um, uh, young people in foster care, um, that has not been um, baselined. Um, and last year, because of um, you know the budget deficit, we had to do I think some creative um, budgeting to um, um, cut out a. Uh, a fair amount of CTL, um, and then try to rely on some um, some state match. Um, and the goal this year, in talking to um, and, and hearing from young people, that this program absolutely works, and they have and they have uh, really solid data and metrics to back that up. It's the the impact has been very favorable. Um, is to make sure that this program is baseline, so that they don't have to not only do they not have to um, worry about the program being cut, but that they're able to retain staff. Um, these are not-for-profit staff that, that are, you know, have to be able to, in June, you know, make sure that they have a job in July. And so um, uh, the goal is to have $20 million of Fair Futures uh, baseline in the FY22 budget. Well, uh, Ingen, uh, we're looking forward to work with you on Fair Futures because we understand the importance of uh, this program. So um, again, um, as part of the adoption process, we'll work with the council, okay, and uh, see what can be done to make sure that uh, the program is fully funded. Um, uh, next topic, um, uh, in my district, there's been a significant uptick in shootings in, um, in and around um, two NYCHA developments, Gowanus and Wyckoff. Uh, gardens, Gowanus Houses and Wyckoff Gardens in, in the Borum Hill section of Brooklyn. And um, these, these two developments do not have um, the, the, the MAP program, MAP, the Mayor's uh, Action Plan program, which was rolled out back in, in 2014, um, but has been limited, as far as I know, uh, just to 15 NYCHA developments. And these are comprehensive services, wraparound services, um, everything from food and healthcare and um, uh, uh, community development, um, and uh, and I think uh, it would be. I mean, this is what I'm hearing from residents. There is that that's the type of programming that they wish to see. And so I was wondering if there's if OMB is working with MockJ on um, potentially expanding the MAP program in, in, in the FY22 budget. Um, we, uh, we, 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 I will reach out, we will reach out to uh, Mark J to uh, see, you know, with respect to this uh, two specific uh, NYCHA development, whether or not this is something that can be done uh, for those uh, uh, developments. Um, but uh, at this point in time, in this budget, con budget, uh, we don't have anything added to it except for the baseline program that we currently have. But again, I we'll strongly encourage, yeah. yeah. We'll, we, we'll reach out to Mark J. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, I'd encourage because I mean, obviously, there's you know scores of developments, uh, NYCHA developments in the city um, that could use that could sure. use these type of programming beyond the 15 that have been allocated. Sure. Um, 
Uh, and last question, uh, this is a capital question. Um, uh, in my district, um, the, the city acquired uh, the city storage site on um, the Williamsburg waterfront. Um, Mayor de Blasio committed to that in 2016, 2017. City acquired the site, this was to, to um, build out um, the Bushwick Inlet Park, which was promised by the Bloomberg administration in 2005. And it was a bit of a fiasco because um, they didn't purchase all the land. And finally, Mayor de Blasio made good on the commitment and acquired the entire site. However, this is this large uh, storage building that used to um, store um, uh, paper. And, you know, um, I'll, I'll just finish my question here. Um, anyway, it's it's uh, the demolition of that building. So this would be the final demolition required um, to at least clear out uh, the entire park um, would cost, I believe it's 15 or $16 million in capital. Um, it would be, it would send a very strong message that the city is on its way to building out this park now 16 years after it was first committed. Um, and so it's my hope that that, uh, that that 15 or $16 million in capital would be allocated to the parks department for the demolition of the city storage site in, um, in Bushwick Inlet Park. Uh, why don't I get back to you on the specific of this? Great. Because this isn't, you know, so um, uh, let me get back to you on this. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Director. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll now hear from Council Member Gibson. Starting time. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Chair Danny Drum and Chair Helen Rosenthal. Good afternoon, Director G. Haas. Good to see you again. And Thank I, you. too, am. Um, a council member who's departing at the end of the year. So I certainly want to extend my deepest uh, gratitude to you and your team for always responding and really availing yourself to council members. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the capital process and I certainly want to recognize uh, DDC. Uh, capital discretionary projects that council members have funded. I want to make sure that we're dedicating resources within OMB to ensure that these projects are moving. Oftentimes we fund projects like mobile units and other projects that just are very slow and they're not moving. And we all realize that a lot of projects have been delayed because of COVID, but I do wanna make sure as we are rebounding and restoring a lot of these projects that we're moving capital discretionary projects ahead. Uh, the second thing I wanted to raise is NYCHA. Chair Rosenthal talked a lot about that. And NYCHA, like many others, struggles with spending city dollars. And if we held them to the same standards, that the federal government does where they have to spend money in a time frame, I think we would see drastic change. So I wanna continue to have conversations with OMB as it relates to NYCHA and a lot of the capital discretionary projects that we fund that have not been moving in a timely fashion. The third thing I wanted to bring up relates to summer youth and you know all year round youth employment and work, learn, grow. Uh, DYCD testified earlier this month and talked about what we're doing this summer. And now while I recognize 75,000 slots is great, uh, I like to aim high, Director, because we have a lot of summer um, activities and we need to make sure that young people are ready and they have opportunities. Um, I know the additional 5,000 slots are dedicated for CUNY. We have set-asides for NYCHA residents, as well as young people that are involved in the criminal justice system. But if there's more that we can do, particularly around SYEP, and Sonic and Compass and the Beacon and Cornerstone programs, I think that will speak volumes to this city council and this administration's commitment to our young people. Uh, the next thing I wanted to bring up is I understand that there are proposed cuts in the higher education budget. And as a CUNY graduate of Baruch College, I certainly wanna speak about the CUNY ASAP program and its impact on CUNY students, many of whom are rent burdened, they deal with food insecurity every day, and we cannot pass a budget director that would provide any cuts to CUNY. I'm sure you agree. So I wanna make sure when you talk about CUNY ASAP and all of the program support services for our students at CUNY that we make sure that we don't just talk about it, but we are about it. Um, and then the last thing while my time winds down, I wanted to ask specifically since I chair the committee on oversight and investigations, uh, Commissioner Garnett testified to us a few weeks ago about the city marshals and the revenue that's generated uh, when they perform judgments for tolls 
and seizing utility meters and other things like that. They projected to generate about $2.3 million annually um, over city marshals in fiscal 2022. I'm wondering, since most of that revenue is returned to the city's general fund, is there any way that the administration could reinvest this money in our city by helping many of these residential and commercial businesses and other establishments avoid eviction? So can we repurpose that money on the front end and do more preventative work so we don't have to look at revenue from evictions in a positive way? Can we really look at you know some more uh, benefits that will help people on the, in the long run. Um, so I hope you took notes and I look forward to working with you and I really thank you so much for uh, your presence and your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I took note and uh, you know, as I said, uh, uh, let's start with ASAP. We are working okay. with the chancellor's office uh, to, uh, I, we know it's a priority uh, for the council and it's a program that is a priority for us as well, but we're working with the uh, chancellor on this issue and to get uh, to a resolution. Uh, with respect to uh, NYCHA, we discussed it earlier and uh, we still think it's, uh, we, we don't wanna say we're gonna move in the same direction as the federal government, because as I said, we don't know, our you know the, the complexity of the issues involved. So before we make any commitment one way or another, uh, it behooves us to basically analyze and review our, you know, our processes, our rules and regulations, and to see whether or not they are consistent with what the federal government is doing and what is the federal government doing that uh, we're not doing that uh, motivate NYCHA into uh, uh, commit more of uh, the federal government density, cap density capital. So again, this is something that we have to uh, review and analyze. Um, so, so many of them. Uh, <laughs> what else? Um, with respect to uh, 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 the youth, uh, as you know, the uh, we just launched uh, Summer Rising, okay, which is a program that basically uh, is going to open up for like 190,000 uh, uh, students. That uh, so that's it's going to be plenty of activities uh, for uh, our youth to engage in uh, during the summer. Sonic um, program has also been restored. There's funding for sonic program, and on top of that, we have about ten thousand cleanup cleanup uh, core that uh, the program that we launch. So there's going to be plenty of things for our youth uh, this summer, in terms of uh, the kind of things they are interested to engage in. And um, so, I'm looking forward to working with you again. Uh, again, good luck in your new endeavor, and and uh, we shall. Uh, uh, um, uh, continue to work. Chair Drum, okay. no other members have raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. I have a few uh, round two questions, uh, uh, Director. During the NYPD's executive budget hearing, the NYPD repeatedly deferred questions on school safety transfer to. DOE to OMB. Uh, as I mentioned during that hearing, this is another component of last year's budget agreement that has yet to materialize. Uh, when will uh, the transfer of school safety agents from NYPD to DOE be reflected in the plan? And can you please re-pledge the administration's commit commitment to making the transfer? Yes, we continue to work on it. Uh, you know, as you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of logistical, a lot of things involved. Uh, to get uh, this done, okay? But uh, we continue to work on it and uh, making sure that uh, the transfer, because I believe we have two years uh, to, uh, to get it done. And uh, right now, we, uh, I, think, I believe all the stakeholders have met uh, to discuss all the large uh, lo logistics and, uh, and uh, some of uh, the uh, uh, challenges but as you can imagine, um, there are so many uh, parties involved and in coordination to, to coordinate to get all these parties involved uh, to get uh, this done. Uh, takes a little time, and that's the reason why we uh, believe at the time that it would take us uh, a good two years to get this process done. But uh, we are actively working on the, on the implementation plan to make this happen. Hey, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I would like to discuss the possibility possibility that NYPD might hire new school safety agents 
to me and to many others, this completely defeats the point of the transfer, which is to have DOE hire and train their own personnel to fit the needs of the students. If NYPD were allowed to hire new agents, they, uh, they would be sticking to the same old model of school safety that we agreed to change over a year ago. So will you allow NYPD to hire these new school safety agents or not? Uh, to be quite honest with you, no decision has been made to hire any uh, new SSAs this year. Okay, so they, they, have, they, they have some uh, vacancies issues, but uh, the administration has not made any decision one or another. Okay, you know, one of the things that I was shocked to learn when I was education chair was that there were 5,000 school safety agents and only 3,000 school psychologists and social workers. And so that speaks very loudly to what the priorities are, not necessarily of this administration, but certainly of previous administrations, uh, where we see policing of students uh, be uh, more important than actually providing services through guidance counselors and social workers. So certainly I hope that um, we don't see that happen during this uh, budget cycle. Uh, as you know, we added uh, social workers uh, to every single school in, uh, in the city. Uh, so because uh, again, as I said, we, uh, we understand the importance of uh, the uh, mental challenges uh, the children are dealing with in school. And uh, we're trying to address them as much as we can by adding social so, workers uh, to, uh, to the budget. But again, as I said, uh, we have not made any decision one way or another uh, in terms of SSAs to add any headcount to SSAs. So, Commissioner, it's our hope that we'll see that transfer happen before this administration leaves office. Um, do you see that happening before then? I, I, I cannot tell for sure, but we're working as hard as we can. We're pushing as hard as we can to try to get this done. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, in the council's budget response this year, we called on the administration to focus on increasing efficiencies, to do a mandatory peg for every city agency with savings targets between three and 5%. Reassessing baseline spending to eliminate duplicate, dupl duplicative Pro programs, revised spending estimates, and established spending controls help, helps us to reduce out-year gaps. Despite our push, the administration has proposed a fairly anemic savings program. Um, why don't we see a PEG program to continue to uh, find efficiencies, particularly when uh, you're doing so much new spending? Uh, uh -uh. As you can see in the, uh, in the budget, uh, we are uh, very much focused on controlling spending. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the plan, our city funded uh, uh, expenses declined by 1.2% in FY21, and they also declined by 0.4% in FY22. As I said in my testimony, <clears throat> we achieved $3.9 billion in savings since June. That is net of the restoration following the stimulus. So, uh, while a large portion of, of that saving is debt service, uh, a lot of it is coming from efficiency gains. And they are not as flashy or large sums of money, but a lot of small changes they add up over time. As we're always looking for savings and exploring new ways to deliver services uh, more efficiently, the challenge that we have, we are in an unprecedented time in the city's history. The uh, federal government provided uh, direct aid to state and localities basically to make up for revenue loss and to avoid uh, layoffs and service cuts. So it's hard, it's, it, it's, we simply cannot on the one hand accept the aid from the federal government, okay? And at the same time, engage in service reductions in pegs, which is a rough tools basically to, because stimulus, you know, the stimulus basically was, is intended must be used to maximize its impact, okay? So it is, so if you look at our budget, the only areas of our budget that is growing is basically uh, expenses that are tied to federal grant, okay, or the stimulus. So again, as I said, we're doing our best in terms of uh, service reductions, okay? 
cut as much as we can. We're looking for always looking for efficiency efficiency gains to basically reduce our expenses. But uh, in this environment where the federal government is saying to us, hey, rather than you cutting services or layoff employees, okay, we're going to provide you the resources so that you don't do these things. So we cannot take the money from the federal government at the same time, engage in major service reductions or layoffs. So that's the challenge. But constantly we look for ways uh, to minimize uh, 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 expenses in this budget alone. We have about 600, over $600 million in savings. So that's always the goal that we have in mind. But as I said, it's the issue that we have of receiving federal aid and at the same time engaging in service reductions or layoffs. Okay, thank you, uh, Director. Over the course of the last year, and especially during the peak of COVID-19, the number of New Yorkers using city parks increased dramatically. At the same time, uh, budget cuts left parks understaffed. The immediate consequence of this combination was a decrease in cleanliness and sanitary conditions of public open green spaces throughout the city. To address this problem, the council in our preliminary budget response called on the administration to add roughly $38.9 million <clears throat> to the parks budget uh, to ensure profit management and maintenance of our parks. So why was this request not included in the executive budget? Well, um, put it to you, all parks uh, uh, reductions related to cleaning have been restored uh, for fiscal year 22. Uh, in addition, uh, yeah. I forget, we also have the citywide cleanup call of which 2,500 positions are dedicated to parks. So we also have otherwise the full seasonal hiring schedule for the parks department this summer. So between the uh, seasonal hiring and the 2,500 CCC uh, uh, people, we believe that we'll have more farmer workers than we ever had before, okay, to address any cleaning issues that you have uh, uh, in the box. Last year, the council successfully negotiated $10 million for 150 maintenance workers in the adopted budget. And this year's budget response request asked for this funding to be added again this year. Um, given the uh, decreased park maintenance and sanitary conditions and the increased number of 311 complaints, why wasn't this funding specifically included in the executive plan and baseline? We had to push for that every single year. Um, yeah, I know. Time. Again, as I said, I understand. I understand. This is again, as I said, this is something that we, you know, we part of uh, negotiation with the council during the adapted budget. But again, as I said, we value New York City parks greatly, and uh, understand and uh, know their importance to the city's landscape. Um, we are working with the parks department to evaluate requests, their requests on a case by case basis. But again, as I said, all park reductions that are related to cleaning have been restored for fiscal year 22. And if there is something that is all very important to the council, uh, we're looking forward to working with the council during the adoption process to see what can be done. Okay. So we look forward to working with you on that also, but let me just say that the um, city cleanup core, which you mentioned, is mm -hmm. only for fiscal 22. However, obviously our need for well-maintained parks is permanent. Um, so, um, uh, you know, shouldn't these core services be maintained by the administration? Yeah, this is uh, this initiative, as you know, is a temporary initiative and we're using uh, federal stimulus funding. Uh, for that uh, project. But as you know, there are so many uh, other baseline uh, programs in uh, at various, at different agencies from our perspective that would uh, basically will maintain sanitation levels uh, once uh, they are restored, okay? So again, as I said, you know, we are comfortable with uh, uh, the level of funding that we have to make sure that uh, city remains clean in the out years. All right, well, as we go through the um, process to the adopter, we'll, I'm sure, talk more about that. Sure. About those workers. Sure. Um, uh, Chair, Chair Rosenthal, do you have any follow-up questions? Okay. Uh, you have muted, Chair. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. I do have a few follow-up, and I appreciate the opportunity and you're staying, um, Director Jihad, just 
for a little bit longer. Um, I want to follow up first on uh, Chair Drum's question about the school safety agents, uh, where you said you don't have any plans to for vacant positions or in the budget. Could you explain to me, could you please detail exactly what that means? Does that mean that you've eliminated all the vacant positions? Uh, no, I mean, they, they have vacancies in, uh, in uh, currently, um, but I think about 400 something vacancies okay, in the operations. Um, but uh, we, uh, we have not made any decision one or another, to, you know, in terms of backfilling uh, those vacancies. Right. So you're implying that is the city in FY22 budgeted for a full headcount complement of SSAs? No, we don't. We, 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 we have authorized headcount. They have, there's a level of otherwise that count, there's the actual <clears throat> that they have. So therefore we have vacancies, but uh, we have not okay, made a decision. Just... This is a decision that the city has to proactively make, okay, right. to bring, to bring a new class, now, but the city has not made that decision. Right, but for now they are budgeted. So hypothetically they could have a class um, given that it's within, this, within the dollar amount of their budget line, right? So if you eliminated the vacant positions totally, in other words, took their head count down by 400, that would be one thing, but it sounds like you haven't done that. No, we have not. We, okay. still, have, we still have in the budget the authorized head count. Okay, you know. all right, yeah. got it. So, you, okay, got it. Um, Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to a, a different, sorry, I'm, I have four very disparate questions, so apologies. Okay, that's okay. Um, short of the capital tracker, uh, although this is very different area, um, we're, we're actually trying to get out a letter to you, it'll come today or tomorrow, and with the idea that for each agency, OMB require uh, um, nomenclature so that if um, something is related to solar, for example, that DOE lists it as solar and DCAS lists it as solar and DDC lists it as solar. Um, just again, for the public to be able to understand what's in the budget right now, this is going to be completely meaningless uh, to everyone, including me, but uh, here's an example. The project IDs from two separate agencies on projects related to solar efficiency. One agency lists it as Apologies again, I don't expect you to know this, but 850-CHSOLAR. Another agency lists it as 057-ACEFDN801. Why not have OMB tell uh, agencies, whenever you have a project that is, you know, here <laughs> are the labels you must use in order to indicate what this project is for. That way the public could really know, gosh, how much money is in the budget for something. Um, you know, if we say, oh, we're spending 12 million on solar, and the public wanted to understand in what agencies do those lie, we could actually do an analysis of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, currently, the, the, the process that we have is basically decentralized. You know, where- Yes, each, it is, that's yeah, right. Where each agency uh, yeah. defined, come that's up- That's right, 
Okay. And I'm asking to centralize. So again, as I said, we uh, this is one of those things that uh, you know this is one of the uh, suggestions that uh, we would take into account. Okay, as we look into this process, okay, to see our best, uh, we could bring light uh, to our budget documents, so that so that the public could understand exactly. I understand exactly uh, yeah. what you're trying to try. Yeah, to great. To I mean, you know, the capital tracker was legislated. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we'll maybe put this idea in the bucket. As part, as part of as part of the discussion, this is one of the ideas that we will consider. Okay, okay. all right. Okay. Because as I said, it's uh, it, it would improve if we could find if we could find the uh, you know again. At the end of the day, it's still it's, it's still going to come down to the detail. Okay. I mean, exactly. You know, whether or not the two products are the same product, you know, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's so, that you know, if it you is had a team you know. of people. Yeah. Uh, all you would have to do is pull together. Seriously, I mean, I could see I'm on a number of task forces, like mm -hmm. dealing with um, construction as harassment. After three meetings with all the right people in the room, yep. we cleaned up stuff so easily it was just a matter of communication this one seems similarly straightforward yeah i, I agree it, it may seem straightforward as i said you know i've been no, in government no. long enough i know it sometimes things look very small and very straightforward and then you know sometimes there, there are some complications but as i said this is one of the suggestions that we will consider okay because it makes sense it makes it makes total sense from our perspective but again, as I said, I don't know what's fully involved before I make any commitment one way or another. Of course, of course. I mean, I'd like I to analyze it, review it, it, and then right. have a team, what, you know. I appreciate that. And what I'm asking is uh, that commitment that we'll sure. at least look at the list of hurdles of course, of and course. then we can figure out how to get over them. Yep, of course. Um, two more quick things. One, I, look, I apologize for not saying this faster. The human service and direct rate, wow, that's such a boon to our nonprofits that do the work that the city tells them to do. Sure. So it, it gets that, it's so meaningful. It's such a big achievement. Um, it's, it's a huge achievement that that number has been baselined and that agencies can now modify their contracts. Nonprofits can now modify their contracts to get that money. Um, you know, really this administration did right by the nonprofits in a way that no other administration ever did. So that, I, I don't think uh, people are giving you enough credit for that. So I just wanted to speak <laughs> publicly. I'm glad you gave um, us credit. <laughs> but of course, but needless to say, of course, you know, this is a budget hearing. So now I'm asking, how about the COLAs? Um, there was a period of time during, again, this administration, and again, huge um, gratitude for recognizing the importance of living wage, uh, of um, of pay adjustments for inflation, are you, but it was only in the budget for three years. Um, I'm wondering whether or not the administration is even considering putting COLAs in a baseline, a baseline way, perhaps following DCA, mm -hmm. sorry, DC 37 uh, negotiation, negotiated settlements. I mean, again, as I said, in uh, you know, we uh, we have made unprecedented investment in the uh, non-for-profit sector. Okay, in partnership with the council, as you know, we increase our indirect, indirect rate. We also invested two hundred forty-three million dollars to fund wage increases. We invested two twenty-seven million dollars for model budgets and with adjustments. Okay, is we just we we're making a lot of progress. The challenge that we have, we also, we still have to deal with uh, some serious high wage gaps. You know, we have some out here gaps that we still have to deal with. Okay, and uh, and it's one of those things that we have to take it one step at a time. Okay, 
uh, we've made uh, some significant inwards and uh, we will again continue to review things uh, going forward to see what can be done what cannot be done but at this point in time i do not want to make a commitment one way or another beyond what we already done okay of so course. until until we see I have a better of picture course. until we have a better picture of uh of the out years in terms of the revenue forecast and so on and so forth it's hard for us to make a serious commitment because as I said, these things will be baseline in the out years. So as That's you great. once you do something like this, it becomes uh, you know. That, so there are ramifications course. in the long run. So again, of course. I mean, yeah. I think what I'm asking then, and and I appreciate what you just said hundred um, percent, except for the fact that the people who work at these nonprofits mm -hmm. are the very people who we are trying to help. They're the people who more likely than not may be facing the eviction crisis. Um, Fully understand. Yeah, so, uh, and 80% are women, people of color, so it's a, it's a mess. Um, I think that I really do hope you can commit to having this conversation in the fall before the end of this administration because, um, you know, I, I would, I think it would be beneficial to the city and make sense for the city that just like they have a labor reserve for DC 37 settlements, I think we should add these nonprofit um, COLAs into that labor reserve as well. That would, that would sort of address, that would address many of these issues, particularly given that um, the city contracts with these nonprofits to do the work that the city is obliged to do. Um, so I I'm, thank you. I'm just putting that on the table. Uh, similarly, our lawyers who we're going to count on to help with the uh, eviction, the pending eviction crisis, are being underfunded uh, by as much as 30%. Um, you know, legal aid and the other legal service providers um, are, you know, have been working overtime, just like all of us have during this pandemic, and they're going to have to continue to do so. But again, the city underfunding them by so much. I think it's important to address that as well. So I'm gonna sort of put that one out there too um, in the bucket of things that I think we have a responsibility to fund. Just sure. putting that on the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I said, you know, this is one of yeah. those things that we've, we've, we've made significant progress. Yeah. But uh, at this point in time, knowing the challenges of we course. have in front of us, it's hard for me to say we're going to make Please. a commitment one or another. You're, okay. you're the budget director. I'm not. I'm not asking you to um, do more than what you know you're seeing the budget allows. So I totally understand. Um, my last point, sort of getting back to this issue of capital commitments, expediting them. I just want to, and the importance of it. I just want to um, give you one example of of how important the expediting these projects are. And this is, um, there's an affordable housing project in my district that was supposed to settle uh, a year or two ago. And, and, a, and like every other project got slow, got stopped by uh, the pandemic. Um, but unfortunately, because their financial straits, this has been going on a super long time, so at this juncture, they are in very serious uh, financial straits. And for that reason, likely we'll have to take out a bridge loan, um, which means they're gonna have to you know, spend high interest rates for that. And uh, because the city now indicated that they won't come through with as much money as they need to renovate their property, the, the um, building has now gone out and gotten half of the money it needs from Freddie Mac at an ever increasing interest rate. Now, I think it's around 4%, where of course city would be at zero. 
Um, I, look, that's just one example in my district. I don't know what's happening uh, in the rest of the city at all, but I give this example to the public to remind us all that there are consequences mm -hmm. for slowing things down. And uh, the consequence here is gonna be a less affordable building. Um, and all because, look, all because of this horrible situation we're in. Um, so I, look, I, you know, I'm sure the issue is much larger than than my district only. I would love to have a commitment from you that whoever does, uh, whichever deputies do HPD, HPD slash HDC stuff, sort of sit down with me to figure out how to uh, unwind this mess. Okay, I mean, I will have uh, my folks, you know, our, our folks uh, uh, meet with you. Great. I uh, have Ivan and Tara meet with you too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, to really see what can be done. Okay, no problem. Thank you so much. I'm done, Pleasure. Chair. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. We have our final question, Council Member Levin. Starting time. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, sorry, Director. Sorry. Um, I have a um, one follow up question about um, Board of Corrections. Um, there, uh, um, headcount has been reduced pretty significantly from uh, where it was in FY20 last year with, with uh, the pandemic, um, you know, causing um, budget cuts. Um, so my understanding is that their headcount um, uh, in FY20 was 38. Um, going into the pandemic, it was 34, and it's been reduced now to 26. Um, and so my question is, would OMB uh, work with the Board of Corrections management to uh, restore uh, to restore the the headcount back up to 34, which is where it was prior to COVID? Yeah, again, as I said, we will uh, we, because we have a, a, a very strict hiring uh, um, attrition initiative in place, 341. Okay, we have really we have uh, uh, basically relaxed those uh, restrictions from a 341 to a 241. And uh, so I believe that, uh, you know, because we're trying to, uh, really, you know, provide some relief to, uh, uh, to the agencies so that they could hire back. So again, as part of that process, I think they should be able to okay. submit calls okay. to OMB and we'll review okay. them accordingly and see uh, whether or not uh, they meet uh, the criteria. And if they do, if they have uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, the space uh, to accommodate in terms of uh, the headcount, we would provide them, uh, uh, would approve whatever powers they provide us. But again, it's, again, we would just relax uh, the 341 to a 241, and that should provide them some relief. Okay. Um, I mean, because it's such a small agency, um, you know, that reduction of, of, of eight heads is, uh, you know, no, I understand. I understand. a quarter of the as, agency. As you, can, as you can imagine, the city went through a major crisis at the time. And so we spare no one, you know, we, uh, we had to make sure we watch every single dollar that, you know. And so therefore, that's, a, that's the only reason we could have reduced our headcount down, bring, you know, bring down, brought down our headcount is because of the measures that we put in place. They were tough. But uh, we had no choice at the time. But we are relaxing, you know, as the economy improves, as city conditions, finances conditions improve, financial conditions improve, we are relaxing those rules. And as I say, over time, they probably be able to get back uh, on track. Okay, no, I appreciate it. Because Board okay. of Corrections obviously serves a vital function in the city sure, of, of sure. oversight. And um, just sure. proportionally, their, their, uh, it, that cut <clears throat> uh, is pretty massive in terms of sure. just the the size uh, related to the entire agency. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Director. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, because you've been so kind to us, uh, Commissioner, and I want you to go, uh, Director. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep saying that because I, uh, I've known you for so long as the Finance Commissioner, but uh, we're gonna let you go a little early, uh, but I just wanna say here, here to uh, Steve's request with the BOC as well. Uh, we thank you for coming in, for being so transparent, and uh, for your leadership over this uh, period of COVID. And uh, we're most grateful to you and your whole team 
Ken Godner and everybody else there. Uh, we look forward to working toward adoption with you and uh, having a, a great budget for New York City this year. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, can, <laughs> thank you, Director. <laughs> thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> Looking okay. forward to working and with you during adoption. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and we'll be speaking with you soon. You. All right. All right. Good. All right. This will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you to OMB for being here. We will move on to the controller uh, at about one o'clock. So we'll take a break, a lunch break until one o'clock, and then we will uh, follow up with the commissioner. Uh, everybody should just stay on this Zoom until that time if they want to, uh, you know, hear from the from the controller. Be back on Zoom at one p.m. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you again, OMB. Bye bye now.
Good afternoon, Mr. Comptroller. Can we test your audio? I'm going to send you an unmute request. Hi, how are you? Doing well. Picking you up loud and clear. Thank you. You'll let me know when I start? Yes. Uh, Just about to start, Mr. Controller. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's ninth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 22. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We just heard from the Office of Management and Budget, and we will now hear from the New York City Controller. Uh, we are joined by council members, uh, Cumbo, Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Ayala, Brooks Powers, Dharma Diaz, Koslovitz, Lewis, Jaeger, Rosenthal. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear from the New York City Controller, Scott Stringer and his deputy controller for budget, Preston Kneeblack. I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Thanks, Chair Drum. Uh, my name is Rebecca Chasen and I am counsel to the New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there can be a delay in this process, so we appreciate your patience. I will now administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the Comptroller's Office. Uh, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Comptroller Stringer? Yes. And Deputy Controller Nyblack? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Comptroller, you may begin when ready. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Chair Drum and members of the Council who are joining us today. I want to thank you once again for the opportunity to discuss the city's fiscal year 2022 executive budget. And I'm also here, as you know, with President uh, Niblack, who's our Deputy Controller for Budget, and will be available to you as well. Um, this year's budget, I believe, can lay the foundation for our immediate and longer term recovery if we get it right. And uh, I'd like to start by just looking at the overall economy um, as we head towards Memorial Day in the beginning of summer. It does really feel like we've turned the corner on COVID. 275 million Americans have received a, at least one vaccine dose and we're poised for a full re recovery and a full reopening. But we aren't out of the woods yet. The numbers for April for the US were disappointing. We're still 8.5 million jobs below the pre-pandemic level. The official US unemployment rate actually inched up from 6% to 6.1%. And here in New York, we are also still struggling with a slow recovery. Although we continue to gain jobs, the unemployment rate remains high, especially for people of color. The number of SNAP and cash assistant recipients is on the rise again indicating that families continue to face economic insecurity. And small businesses, well, their revenues remain depressed. The slow recovery continues to affect our revenues as well. But thankfully, President Biden's American Rescue Plan provides a much needed shot in the arm for our economy and for our city budget. So let me now turn to the mayor's executive budget. The budget has gone up significantly since the preliminary budget in January. The modified budget for this fiscal year, 2021, is $100.7 billion. That's $5.6 billion more than in January. And the budget the mayor has proposed for next year is $98.6 billion, and that's up $6.2 billion. After that, spending is projected to rise again, or at least start rising again. My office believes that we will see additional tax revenues this year and next 
above what the mayor's office projects. But that will still leave budget gaps that remain close to $4 billion a year through the end of the financial plan in fiscal 2025. The spending increases this year and next are fueled by an additional $15.7 billion in federal COVID-related aid in the budget. That includes $1.4 billion in increased reimbursements from FEMA for COVID disaster-related expenses and additional funds from the CARES Act. We're receiving nearly $7 billion in federal funds to be used for education purposes, passed through to us by uh, the state budget. And the city stands to receive $5.9 billion from the president's stimulus bill that we'll be able to use, we'll be able to use it for a wide range of purposes. And just this week, in fact, we received the first installment, $2 billion in direct American rescue plan aid to the city. The most important question we can ask about this budget is, how are we using these federal funds? This is an unprecedented amount of money to address an unprecedented crisis. The budget as it was presented was far from transparent, but I've taken the time with our staff to go through and analyze almost all of the $15.7 billion. And for the purposes of reporting you to you today, I'm gonna to identify five broad purposes that that $15.7 billion will be used for. The first and largest is responding to and recovering from the pandemic and beginning to reopen our economy. Over half of the total funds will go to these initiatives. This category includes two and a quarter billion dollars for the public health response to the pandemic, for vaccination and immunization, for testing and tracing, for safe, safely reopening schools and more. The administration has also proposed 2.8 billion for initiatives to help with reopening our economy and assisting those in need. The biggest single piece of this category though is $3.6 billion in DOE programs. Some of the purposes of this spending are clearer than others. There's $850 million for academic recovery and student support services over the next three years to address our children's learning loss and their social and emotional needs after literally a year out of school. And I think that is just terrific, incredible and des desperately needed. But we also have to look at there's $1.4 billion for something labeled operational support and $840 million for quote unquote programmatic and instructional support. The administration needs to tell you in more detail uh, how these funds will be used for these broad categories in DOE and I recommend you ask those questions. The mayor has also proposed using $866 million in stimulus funds to restore previously proposed budget cuts primarily in the Department of Education and I think that's great. Uh, also to restore the street basket collections that were cut last year by the Department of Sanitation. I think that's great as well. The mayor is also using stimulus funds to defer savings he sought from the city's labor unions this year and next, and to replace city funds for general budget purposes. One of the major uses of stimulus funds that we can all agree will be uh, critical is the programming and expansion of existing programs. And the biggest initiative here is the expansion of Universal 3K, a goal I know we all support. These are There are other new expanded programs in the budget uh, that would fund using stimulus dollars, such as expanding and improving services for seniors, providing adequate overhead reimbursement for nonprofit social service contractors, and providing access to council and housing court. Once again, these are all important initiatives that I fully support, and I believe we must make sure that we have a plan for how we're going to pay for them permanently. Because, you know, that's the problem with using stimulus funds for new programs. How do you pay for them when the stimulus funds run out? And I ask you to consider that during your budget deliberations. Um, so how should we be using our stimulus funds? Well, in the short term, I believe the priority must be the businesses across the city that have been hardest hit by the shutdown. Recently, my office released our second survey of the experience of MWBEs during the pandemic. We found that half of MWBEs had to be laid off or furlough employees during the pandemic, and that nearly a third expected they won't be able to pay rent in the next three months. Businesses need our help. Despite all the stimulus funds available to provide budget relief and to make up for the revenues we've lost as a result of the economic shutdown, the mayor's plan does little to reduce the gaps we're facing in the future. And we're still not asking our agencies to look closely at their budget for savings to see how they could provide their services as efficiently as possible. 
If every agency worked as hard as OMB did with our public finance team to find savings from refinancing our city bonds, well, those out year gaps would probably be a lot lower than they are. And we could be using those savings to rebuild our reserves to create a budget cushion for the future. As things stand, we've done very little in this financial plan to bring our reserves back to the level I've long recommended, which should be 12% of funds uh, of, of city fund spending. In fact, our budget cushion has fallen to under 8% with no plan to increase it. We must have an ongoing savings plan to match our spending plan so that we can sustain the services New Yorkers want in the future. One thing, though, I want to talk to you about today, something that we should not do, is rush through unnecessary budget actions that will save us money now, but cost us money in the future. The city's actuary, working with the mayor, has, provo has proposed changes in um, in the way we calculate how much we contribute each year to the city's pension systems for city worker retirement benefits. It's a complicated calculation. Uh, I wanna explain how it works. First, the pension funds have a target rate of return, as many of you know, set in law and is currently at 7%. If returns fall short of that target, then we have to increase contributions to make up the difference. The actuary is seeking to lower that target rate of return. Now, that may sound good, but actually, if we assume we're going to make less on our investments, we then have to pay more to make up the difference. So that would cost taxpayers over $400 million a year when it's fully phased in. But in the eight years I've been controller, our investments have exceeded that target return, earning 8.65% on average. So not only did we hit the 7% target, but we exceeded it and we now earn 8.65%. Now, generally any difference between the target return and the actual returns, that is money that's phasing over time. But in return for lowering the target rate of return, which as I said, will increase pension contributions in future years, the actuary and the mayor are proposing that we speed up the phase in, uh, to, that we phase in the recent market returns. And that would lower how much we have to pay in the pension funds with most of the savings coming this year and next. In effect, a deal has been made to provide the mayor with additional cash now and to push the costs off to later. Now, as I said, changing the assumed rate of return requires legislation in Albany and cannot be done unilaterally by the actuary. And the city, quite frankly, based on what I just told you about the funds coming in, we don't need these savings right now. In fact, personal income tax revenues this year are likely to exceed the mayor's executive plan projection by over a billion dollars. And for those of you who are historians like Danny Drum, we've been here before. 20 years ago, the city under Mayor Giuliani agreed to a market restart that recognized the growth of earnings in the pension funds and then lowered the city's contributions in the short term. But that left the funds in dire straits when the tech bubble burst the next year and the stock market tumbled. Because once you recognize all the gains, you've got no cushion left to absorb the losses. So I raise this with you because these are serious steps that deserve to be done by consensus between all the parties, including the pension board of trustees. So I would just say to all of you, let's slow down, give these major steps the thoughtful consideration they're due rather than to jam them through during this budget cycle. And finally, I just wanna say we need to make investments to build a strong foundation for the new economy. We've seen how slowly jobs are returning. The bad news is some of those old jobs are never coming back, but other sectors like tech and healthcare can't find enough workers to fill the jobs. So we need to train our workers now for the jobs of the future. And we should be using stimulus funds to make capital investments for the future. Capital investments are a smart use of one-time stimulus funds. We can use that stimulus cash to make investments that will pay dividends down the road and save money in the future. The American Rescue Plan explicitly mentions two areas of capital spending that funds can be used for. First is broadband access and water and sewage systems. Uh, we all know a lot about broadband access. Uh, it's an urgent need. Too many of our children lack internet access in public housing and homeless shelters around the city. We should never put our children in that situation again. Also, we have to do the work that doesn't make the newspapers all the time, but we have to modernize our water and sewer systems. And this is a way we can do that, especially 
water and sewer system, which is already facing challenges of climate change. Um, well, in concluding, let me just say that we are at a defining moment in our history. We need to use this moment to build for our future, to get our house in order, to invest in the new economy, and to correct the inequities exposed by the pandemic and lift New Yorkers who were underserved and overexposed. This should be our North Star. And I'm happy once again to uh, be here with all of you. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Speaker Johnson for the courtesies he's given me over the years as I come before you. And now, if you have any questions, uh, Preston and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Mr. Controller. And uh, we do have a few questions. Let me start off by talking with you about uh, banking needs and cash management. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Committee on Finance recently held a hearing on a few pieces of legislation, which it hopes will create better transparency of the city's banking related activities. Given that the controller's office plays a significant role in monitoring Hello. Danny, I think you froze. No, please bear with us. We'll try to get the chair back. Okay. I, I'm I'm here. Is our controller okay? Yes, I'm here. you broke okay. up a little bit. Perhaps you could repeat the question. Sure. In your time as controller, have you identified <clears throat> any contractual inefficiencies in the city's depository and non-depository activities? And if so, what were they? Uh, I, I haven't, um, but I'd be happy. I'm generally supportive of the intent of what you're trying to do. And we'll certainly work with you, Chair, to uh, discuss this further. Okay, thank you. Uh, your office invests a portion of the city's cash balances into various forms of liquid investments, earning interest income on these balances. What is the approval process for this type of cash investing? Preston, do you want to tackle this? Certainly, thank you. Uh, the, the parameters for what we can invent, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, the parameters for what the city and other local governments in the state can invest in are laid out actually in state law uh, and basically limited to um, treasury bills and notes, well, treasury bills actually, and uh, uh, agency, federal agency securities and some short term commercial paper. Uh, so that's, you know, we use those instruments, uh, our short term trading desk uses those instruments to uh, which is a fairly limited range uh, of, of available instruments on the market, uh, but to manage our cash balances to, uh, uh, you know, get the highest returns we can. What, what consideration is given to the city's treasury prior to transferring cash out of city depository accounts for investing? I, uh, I mean, basically it's the set of banking relationships that we have that's established uh, by the banking commission, which is, you know, the mayor, the finance director and the controller, uh, or the finance commissioner rather and the controller. Um, it's not Latanya, should be, but it's not. Um, and uh, uh, and the, as I said, the legal framework that exists, there's, you know, the city has a numerous bank accounts um, which it's required to do prudentially just to make sure that there's not, you know, too much money concentrated in any one bank. Um, there's an overnight sweep and then those cash balances are invested every day. Uh, that's basically the, the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, if the city were to create a municipal owned bank, what do you identify would be the most significant set of advantages and disadvantages as it relates to the city's banking needs? I think uh, that our, our banking needs are currently met, obviously, by you know a set of commercial banks. Um, in order to to 
have the same set of uh, you know, kind of safeguards uh, for our funds, a bank that was chartered by the city would have to meet all of those same standards, be overseen by uh, the State Department of uh, Financial Services and by the control of the currency, et cetera. So all of those you know, safeguards would have to be put in place um, in order for us to use a bank that was chartered by the city. Um, obviously there are, you know, there are possible, there are a whole range of possible, you know, things that a city chartered bank could do, um, but it's limited by the, uh, uh, it's limited by the sort of allowable, legally allowable. Um, in general, I think that we've been supportive of the creation of public banking infrastructure uh, to protect the city from, or to protect the New Yorkers from uh, predatory financial services and to help redirect profits you know, from Wall Street to the city. But uh, there are some, you know, as I said, there are some practical constraints that would have to be addressed. Also, let me add, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if you'd like to have more in-depth conversations about this apart from the current budget testimony, be happy to set up a meeting uh, with our professional staff and you and anyone else in the council who's interested, uh, you should know we're now back limited, uh, we're now back in our office, so we can certainly hold uh, appropriate socially distant meetings. I'd be happy to work with you on this. Okay, thank you. And I'll take you up on that, Mr. Controller, uh, as I try to get a grasp of all of the issues surrounding it. But thank no you. Sure. Offer. Um, as controller, you sit on the city's banking commission, which recommends to the council what interest rates should be charged on the late payments of property taxes and water charges, which the council then sets by resolution. This year, the banking commission recommended interest rates that largely mirror the rates adopted last year, though with slightly lower rates for quarterly payers and the first ever rate recommendation for a new class of medium valued properties recommended quarterly payers be charged 3.25% in the first quarter and 4.5% for the remaining three quarters. Why did the commission recommend a mid-year step up in the rate rather than a single rate for the whole year? Preston? We are, uh, we have to, we, there, there's a, a floor basically on the rate that we can do, which is uh, tied to prime. Uh, so we can do a blended rate that gets us there, but we can't, we couldn't do the, the zero rate for the whole year. It's, uh, it's not legally uh, in the charter. It sets a, a minimum and that would have been below the minimum. What's the, the minimum? If we, if we could have, if we could have, if we would have, we, if we could, we would. It's tied to prime, I believe. Let me, let me get back to you with the exact details of it, but that's the basic, that's, that's why it was done that way last year and did the same thing again this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, why did the Banking Commission recommend leaving the 18% rate charged to larger properties unchanged? Uh, and can you provide the rationale for the interest rate on property taxes for these businesses to be 18% while the interest rate for the late payment of business taxes is only 7.5%? Control, you want me to? Yeah, you finish this up for me. I don't, uh, the, uh, the I, I'm not party to the Banking Commission's decisions, but I think uh, the basic rationale for the 18 and a quarter percent is these are large properties, generally almost exclusively commercial properties, large commercial properties like office buildings. Um, the sort of, the, the rate is set in a way to be competitive with essentially a credit card rate uh, commercial credit card rate. So it's sort of, you know, if you had to choose between uh, paying off your credit card or paying off your property taxes, that's, you know, you, you would have a choice here that was uh, balanced between those two things. That, that's sort of the historical kind of rationale for it. Um, the rest, I would have to get back to you about the details of it. As I say, I'm just not, I'm not familiar enough with the deliberations of the commission uh, this year off the top of my head. Okay, thank you, um, me Black, and we're going to go over to Councilmember Rosenthal for questions. Are we okay? You still need. 
Okay. Good to see you, Controller Stringer. Um, thanks so much, uh, Chair Drum. Just some really quick capital questions. Um, so the uh, Director Jiha and Commissioner uh, Springer Torres talked about uh, things they did to expedite the capital commitment process, um, trying to speed things up uh, because of the, of course, pause during the pandemic. And they talked about some sort of rules they were allowed to uh, set aside uh, during this emergency time that they'll have to, you know, not follow when we go back to regular times. Um, also, uh, the director talked about some things his office has done to expedite contract approval. I'm wondering two things, whether or not your office, uh, what your office has done to expedite contract approval, because it really does sound like commitments are getting out there quickly. Um, and secondly, whether or not you approve the state legislation um, that DDC is proposing. So what I can tell you is for FY21, the capital contract reg registrations to date is about $7 billion. Mm -hmm. And we have pending in the queue as of Friday, another 75 contracts for a total of 712 million. Mm -hmm. And we are expediting and moving the capital spending as the contract comes in, we review it. And to the extent that there are delays in contract registration, uh, that is not us. Uh, the agency sends us contracts and we register with them within 30 days, unless of course there's concerns about the integrity of the procurement process. All the delays so far were due to the administration suspension of yeah. most of the capital program for the better part of the you know, the past year. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for that. Actually, you're giving us fresh information compared to what OMB testified this morning. So thank you for that update. And yeah, it's terrific to hear they would be able to commit 7.7 .7 billion by the end of this year, perhaps even more will come through shortly. Specifically, did your office, I mean, that's amazing. And obviously your office played a hu ro huge role in that. Um, well, well, let's go to the state law changes then, whether or not you would support DDC's um, state law change requests. Uh, I don't, I haven't taken a position yet. And I would have to review it. Yeah, I would. I think it's interesting. Um, so, so it would. Um, it's important to review it. And then, just lastly, again on the capital projects. Um, and I guess this is both on the expense and on the capital side for contracts. Um, uh, I think what I've heard over the years from the mayor's office is that contracts are often sent back for reasons that are outside the purview of what a controller, you know, is, um, you know, within, you know, just if you had blinders on, you know, what a controller can uh, ask questions about, but they've always been very accommodating. I've never heard them complain about it at all. Um, and certainly not at a public hearing. Um, which is great. And I know you're, you know, really laser focused on making sure the contracts that are registered are wholly vetted. Um, but what do you think about that? as a practice going forward. Do you think controllers, I mean, perhaps we should, you know, change a law, change a charter to give city controllers a wider berth uh, for questions to 
to ask about contracts before they're registered? Well, I, I don't know what you heard. I can tell you what we do. Uh, when we review a contract, we look to make sure that we prevent double billing. We have to ensure the completion of the contract. We have to make sure that the scoring is fair. And then we have to make sure that there's no fraud or any intent of fraud. Yeah. As you are aware of the investigations and uh, agents of the city in this administration. Yeah. Uh, what our job was to make sure that we could head that off. Yeah. And that's why we took the contracting uh, review process very seriously. And I have to tell you, and I want to shout her out, uh, but the deputy controller uh, responsible for contracts, Lisa Flores and her team, register 30,000 contracts and they make sure that there's not a hint of impropriety. And it's not even impropriety almost, but it's also making sure that the contract, you know, complies with the rules and the laws. And that is the job of the controller's office. And I would be surprised if any agency would be happy with our review process. I wouldn't be, but it's the job that we have to do. And, mm. uh, and I think we've done it very well. I always love shout outs. So that was awesome. Um, I'll tell me, Lisa you said so. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, and then just specifically though, how did the Bronx um, parent housing network contracts then slip through given all the red flags there were about them um, sort of, you know, there being financial questions and, and, and apparently even DHS had called them in and said, you have to clean this up, you know, year after year after year. How did those slip through? I mean, we've since learned there were even more egregious things going on from my perspective. I don't know what you think. Um, yeah, sort of, so, so what do you think happened there? Well, I think that's exactly why you need uh, why you need more oversight, not less. And you have to continue to ask these questions. And quite frankly, those contracts should have been stopped at the front end, not the back end. And I agree with you. I mean, to your question about the role of the controller's office, this is the kind of oversight that we need and not just oversight by us, but other government entities. I hear you and look, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but- You're not putting, Helen, you're not putting me on the spot. I'm just answering the question question is, uh, what do you do with contracts like that and those providers? You got to also, uh, as the, on the mayor side, you have to know with who you're contracting with. And this is, should not be a surprise. And we've seen this all too often over the last eight years. Yeah, no, I'm uh, okay. Uh, but I asked you about your office. And Was I answered that, you about my office. So your office approved all these contracts. The contracts that get approved for the office, as you know, are registered unless we can find uh, outright fraud. Many times we're able to catch it. When we don't catch it or we can't prove it, we do send the contract back. You mm -hmm. voiced concerned about the us doing that perhaps more than we should. And then your second round of questions makes it clear why we need to do this work because we try to okay. ask a lot of questions to make sure that we prevent these bad things from happening. Yeah, no need to get defensive. I'm not trying to, again, I'm really not trying to put you on the spot, but um, this- I don't, feel, I don't feel on the spot. Okay, so, so on this one in particular, did you ever send it back? I would, I would have to check how many times we sent it back. I don't, have the, I don't have a contract in front of me, but I could get that for you. I think that's an important example. And you know what? You're right. That's an example of one where perhaps it was outside the purview of the controller's office to ask, but boy, sure important and a good example of something the controller should absolutely send back given that DHS leadership or, or DSS leadership was sitting down with the vendor and saying there are financial uh, 
irregularities here. So yeah, that one stands out for yeah. me. That one would be good, I think, for a council hearing too. Yeah. Oh right. goodness. Yes. And with apologies, I'm in my office and uh, I have a constituent I need to say hello to. So thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, controller. Great talking to you as always. Thank you again, Mr. Controller. I have a follow-up question for you. Um, let me just go back to where my questions were. OMB testified that the out-year budget gaps are manageable. They did this this morning uh, and within historic norms. However, we've heard from budget watchdogs that the out-year gaps are huge and uns uns What's your opinion on this? And what are your suggestions on how to address these gaps? Look, I, I think, I think, I think we should be concerned about these out year gaps and we should start, as I mentioned in the testimony, uh, as we deal with the city's recovery, I do think we have to put more money away in savings. Uh, I mentioned that 12% of, of spend would be optimal. Uh, to get us to where we have to be. That's about four hundred, four and a half billion dollars that should be put away in savings. I recognize that that's not going to happen right away. But over the course of the financial plan, I do think, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we should think about how to save more because we just never know what's going to come our way. And clearly, we didn't know COVID would come. And we're fortunate that we have resources from the state and federal governments. But it could have easily gone the other way. And so what I would recommend is you look at budget gaps in the out years. We do have to look for savings in our city agencies. We do have to take the view that every dollar counts, even as we're rebuilding the city. And I think the best antidote to something that could go wrong two or three years from now is about savings. I also want to re-up what I said earlier, which is you know the stimulus money, which will be here for two and a half years, uh, gives us an incredible opportunity to invest in education and, you know, sustainability and job creation. But again, we have to match the stimulus with long-term revenue to keep those programs going beyond the life of the stimulus money. Thank you. And I, I've heard you mention that the 12 percent before. I think the best that we ever did was get maybe close to 10 or, or, or about $9 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, I do, I do want to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll give them credit, uh, in, in the Bloomberg administration, at one point, we were at 18%. Wow. So we just have, I think, collectively, you know, perhaps this is a good time to start doing this work, because I know you feel strongly about it as well. Yeah, definitely. And so did the speaker about uh, putting more money into yes. savings. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> this morning also at the hearing, the OMB director uh, answered uh, some questions about uh, federal money and saying that um, they couldn't uh, really do a stronger savings plan because we're getting so much money from the federal government and we can't take them with one hand and cut with the other hand. In other words, he couldn't do savings because he's making the argument that we need stimulus funding. What's, what's your opinion on that? Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, what I'm suggesting and what I've always suggested is we're not cutting. What we're doing is finding efficiencies so that we can redirect the money to the programs that would do the most good for our children, for our seniors. You know, I, I, I sort of take the view that it is good that we have the stimulus money, but you also have to start thinking about where we're going to be three years from now. And in order for us to stay out of trouble and to remain fiscally viable, when I say look at agency efficiencies, we're not going to cut a program, but we're going to look at ways to reduce frivolous costs, manage outside consultants and contracts better, because that is going to pay dividends literally, not today, not today and not when I'm controller or not this council, but it's going to pay dividends three, four years from now. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I really agree with you on that and um, look forward to continuing to work with you. I think we're going to wrap it up here, Mr. Controller. We're a little bit early, but uh, nevertheless, I want to thank you for your time coming in and uh, for giving us some, some straightforward and um, um, transparent answers to our questions. 
Uh, and I thank you. I, I just want to say also, this is my last um, executive budget, and I've appreciated working with you on so many different occasions, and uh, particularly as the finance chair, uh, I've enjoyed our hearings with you as well. So thank you very much, Mr. Well, Controller. Well, if I could, if I could, Chair Chair Drum, I also want to say thank you very much. I've enjoyed serving as controller. This is my last budget presentation as controller. And uh, I want to just say you have always treated uh, our office with great respect. I've enjoyed the back and forth over the years. And uh, I just want to say thank you. I think your leadership of the finance of the city uh, will prove very critical uh, as generations look back on this time period and you know, sort of analyze what we did and didn't do. But I think you will be uh, well regarded uh, as uh, the chair of the uh, finance committee. My feeling as well about uh, your your work also as the controller. Thank you very much, Mr. Thanks. Controller. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, everybody. We will now take a break until uh, about 2 p.m., I guess, when we'll have IBO come in. Uh, am I right on that, Council? Yes, Chair. Okay, so 2 p.m., we'll start with IBO. Thank you.
Good afternoon to the members of the IBO. Uh, can we do a quick audio check? I will be sending you an unmute request. Um, I'm unmuted. Hello? Excellent. Picking you up loud and clear. Very good. Can you um, hear me? Yep, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Thank you. And do you hear me? <clears throat> yes, sir. Picking up loud and clear. Thank you so much. Okay. We will be beginning shortly. Good afternoon, is everyone ready to begin? Yes. Okay, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to the city council's ninth day of hearings on the mayor's executive budget for fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the finance committee. We previously heard from the controller and now we will hear from the Independent Budget Office. Let me announce my colleagues who are here with us. Uh, Councilmember Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Ayala, Brooks Powers, Donna Diaz, Koslowitz, Lewis, Rosenthal, Yeager, and our Majority Leader, Lori Cumbo. Um, now in the interest of time, Time. I will forego an opening statement before we hear from the IBO director, uh, Lorani Lowenstein, the deputy director, George Sweet, and the director for budget review, Jonathan Rosenberg. I'm going to turn it over to council in a minute for some procedural items at the square and the witnesses. I may have to leave and I apologize to you, but I need to have emergency dental treatment done on the road to cap and it's, it's um, oh. scraping and um, it's got a very oh. sharp point to you. So I apologize to you if I do have to leave early, uh, but you'll be in the good hands of, of council member Helen Rosenthal. So I'm gonna now turn it over to our um, 
uh, our council who will uh, go through the procedural items and ask, and I guess swear you in as well. Thank you, Chair. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I'm counsel to the New York City's Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in this process and we appreciate your patience. I will now minister the affirmation to the witnesses. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Ms. Lewinstein. I do. Mr. Sweeting. I do. Mr. Rosenberg. I do. Thank you. Director Lowenstein, you may begin when ready. Okay. Good, in, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm especially pleased to be able to testify because I can say that the city's economic and fiscal outlook is genuinely better than it looked back in March when we testified last. That improved outlook is largely attributable to a combination of things, but certainly the federal stimulus funds we've received and vaccination rates of upwards of 40% that have allowed the city's economy to once again begin to open. Looking first at the local economic situation, uh, a year ago, we lost 615,000 jobs on a fourth quarter to fourth quarter basis, which were certainly the steepest losses uh, recorded for the city since the losses began being recorded. Um, but now we expect the city to pick up 264,000 jobs during the current calendar year and nearly 200,000 jobs more next calendar year. Um, although those gains are very strong, um, they take us only about three quarters of the way back to where we started before the pandemic. Um, moreover, we don't expect the city to recover the same number of jobs it lost in 2020 until sometime in 2024. I should also note that the city's recovery has been considerably slower than that of the US, which has really rebounded strongly. Um, I think one big reason it's taking us longer to bounce back is our very heavy reliance on travel and tourism. Um, industries such as accommodations, food services, arts, entertainment, um, are all sectors that were hit very hard by the pandemic and are just slowly starting to reopen. I guess restaurants more quickly than others, but certainly the arts and entertainment are slow coming back. Um, while our economic forecast is more pessimistic than OMB's, our revenue forecast is actually more optimistic than OMB is. And it's stronger for each year of the financial plan period. We're anticipating between $1.2 billion and $1.4 billion more a year in tax revenue each year than OMB. That's mainly attributable to our forecast for the real property tax and for the personal income taxes. Conversely, we're expecting less in business taxes than OMB does. Um, just adding a note about the council, uh, for this year and next, we're actually more optimistic in terms of tax revenues than council finance although the situation reverses for the at use of the forecast period when we are uh, slightly more pessimistic than the council. But overall, we're expecting more tax revenue, a lot more tax revenue than we forecast in February, which is a reflection of the city's continuing and improving economic outlook. Um, although the additional tax revenues are helpful, um, it's really the nearly $13 billion in new federal stimulus um, that has had the biggest impact on our fiscal outlook. Uh, through 2025, we're anticipating 730 million will be used to restore programs cut back due to the pandemic. 1.7 billion in total to expand existing programs that will help aid the city's recovery. 1.3 billion to forestall municipal layoffs this year and next and 1.8 billion to replenish budget reserves. We estimate, however, that 4.2 billion, which is about a third, the newly recognized federal funds, have been allocated to fund ongoing, ongoing initiatives for each year of the financial plan period. So we're using monies that are limited in duration and 
for many of them, those revenues, uh, applying them to things that go on well past the financial plan period. So looking just at the $7 billion in federal pandemic aid for education, about $3 billion will go towards initiatives continuing past 2025. The biggest continuing component, of course, is the $2 billion to provide pre-K to three-year-olds across the city. Um, a commitment that's gonna go on regardless, you know, long after the federal funds are gone. There are a number of other baseline programs. Uh, again, the total over the period, let me just give you the two biggest. Uh, 260 million to fully fund the indirect rate payments, which is reimbursing not-for-profit service providers for their overhead costs. Another 150 million for the partial restoration of the citywide hire increase, and it goes on from there. The issue isn't whether these are good things to spend money on, but rather how we're going to fund these initiatives after the federal fin stimulus funds are gone. Uh, for now, uh, the budget looks manageable, I think is the term we used. Um, we project that next year, 2022, fiscal 22, will end with a surplus of $1.3 billion rather than be balanced as OMB projects. And although we're projecting a gap of 4.1 billion for 23, if you apply that $1.3 billion surplus, that brings the 23 gap to a manageable uh, 2.7 billion, which is less than 4% of city expen city's own expen funded expenditures. Um, and that makes it manageable, especially given that we've got reserves of 1.25 billion dollars in each year from fiscal 23 on, and we will have restored the Retiree Health Benefits Trust to $3.8 billion. As always, there are a ton of risks associated with our forecast. The biggest risk, however, remains the pandemic itself. Um, you know, whether it continues to be controlled, whether people continue to get vaccinated, whether we avoid new and more lethal variations of the, of the pandemic. The other big risk associated with the pandemic is its impact on people's behavior. Um, how many of the people who are now working remotely are gonna feel good coming back on the subway and going back into their office, um, even going to the theater? If they don't, or sizable numbers of them don't, then these are long-term structural changes that will have very long-term impacts, not just on real estate in New York City, but also on New York City's tax revenues and, and even the, the vibrancy and the vigor of, of midtown and downtown, which you know is a big part of the reason people come here, for the bustle and the crowds and the terrific restaurants and all the other things that people working in these areas, people commuting to these areas and tourists coming to these areas support. Um, and speaking of tourists, that's of course the other big issue that we're facing. Um, how long will it take them to come back? Whether international tourists in particular, who are some of the most lucrative tourists in terms of the businesses that serve them, um, feel safe and secure and feel that the city is again an attractive destination. Um, and then finally, I think there are the business travelers, um, many of whom, many of whose firms have probably decided that there are different ways to do business travel than there used to be. And if you can be on a Zoom meeting uh, and be talking to your customers just the way we are now, uh, why not, you know, avoid the, the costly mm -hmm. business travel that businesses used to incur? So all of those are questions, they're questions in the near term for the financial plan period, but also just for the longer term, whether there are big structural changes that don't necessarily show up in a year or two, that don't necessarily get captured by the economic models we use. Um, let me just end by saying that New York has just endured one of the most certainly tumultuous and difficult years in modern history. The actions that this council and this mayor take in just the brief period of time they remain in office are going to have repercussions throughout the financial plan period. And I urge them to keep that in mind as they proceed. So thank you. 
and we're looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Director Lowenstein. And let me just say thank you also to um, Mr. Sweeting and Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, you know, I've uh, been chair of the Finance Committee for the last four years, and I really appreciated you coming in and giving us information. It's for my last term, so I'm not going to have the opportunity to do this again with you. Uh, but uh, ever since uh, we met that day in New York One <laughs> for our interview, uh, that was a great day. And I really appreciate having the opportunity to work with you on so many different issues. So thank you. Oh, can I thank you? I mean, we've, we've never had this collegial a relationship with council finance ever. And I don't <laughs> think it's something that we take for granted. <laughs> and I would hope that going forward uh, that you know, the, the cooperation, collegiality continues. It's been great. So thank you. Well, we rely, thank you. We rely on you for so much information, you know, even when I was Ed Chair and we did some reports together, um, you know, that were vitally important to, um, to letting us know what we're on. So uh, we definitely appreciate that relationship. Thank you again. Uh, in this executive budget report, the IVL estimates that the administration allocated about $4.2 billion or a third of the federal stimulus funds from the American Rescue Plan Act and the Corona, uh, Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act towards baseline programs. That action would require, would require the city to locate alternative funding sources or cut spending in order to maintain budget balance if those baseline programs are allowed to run beyond the current financial plan period. Given the remaining uncertainties around the city's finances going forward, what challenges could this action pose for the next administration? Well, I think, as, as I mentioned when I was testifying, that's a great deal of money. And in order to continue those programs, whether you agree with them or not, and they may be terrific, uh, the city's gonna have to find, if they want to continue them, they're gonna have to find savings elsewhere or find other ways to raise revenues, uh, none of which are easy lifts. Um, uh, is there anything else I should add to that, George, Jonathan, is there? I mean, there's the possibility that the economic forecasts will prove to be somewhat more pessimistic than, um, than the, certainly what we worked with. If the economy came back even stronger than and more rapidly than, than being anticipated, that would that would generate additional revenue without having to actually increase taxes. Right? That would, but that's uh, I'm not predicting. <laughs> no, but the other point that we did make in our report itself was that the current mayor and the current council are making decisions on behalf of a government that's going to be largely new starting in January. And based upon new governments that we've seen come and go, um, they're gonna have their own programs and initiatives they'll want to fund. And so there's gonna have to be room in the budget for those campaign promises and other priorities to be funded as well. Which areas of the budget would you have wanted to uh, <laughs> fund or to strengthen? Okay. Um, I should say that one of the best things about being IBO director <laughs> is that we don't make recommendations. So uh, we, we dodge them at all costs. Um, <laughs> I think that we focus on being the source of reliable numbers and leave to the elected officials of New York City the much harder trade-offs that you have to make between them. So I don't envy you the position you're in even remotely, but my personal opinion doesn't count here. All right, let me see if I can get you to answer this one. <laughs> in uh, one of the IBO's budget options, you consider the pros and cons of allowing the city's relocation and employment assistance program to expire. This program provides a break on the city's business taxes uh, to help firms relocate to locations outside of the core of Manhattan. Uh, it is used by a small number of firms and does, uh, to, uh, does appear to play a role in the city's economic development. 
The program is hard to study because IBL excluded by state law is excluded by state law from obtaining information on the program. If you had access to relevant data, what questions would you ask? I'm gonna hand that one to George. Um, thank you. Um, uh, you know, one, one set of questions, and th this goes back to um, local law that was passed uh, several years ago, where the city council was interested in, in uh, improving the evaluation, the, the, the rigor of the evaluation of tax expenditures uh, for economic development. And there was a task force that came up with a set of proposals that recommended there be an, an, an entity in the city that would have the uh, resources, including the data, to uh, answer questions like this. And uh, the final legislation uh, named IBO as uh, the party to do that. I think one of the questions um, you'd want to ask about these, the, the REAP program in particular, but about all of these, is you know, how much difference does the benefit actually make to the, um, you know, the bottom line of the recipients of the companies? And in order to do that, you really need to be able to get in and uh, understand a little bit better. You can't just look at number of employees or just total profits. Uh, you'd want to look at um, you know, some, you'd want to get some sense of how um, the you know that the investments the firm is required to make uh, translate into a higher output if they do, uh, and therefore higher tax revenues for the city. Um, so certainly, you know, it would be an evaluation really of the. Uh, it would be looking beyond employment data, primarily, in order to understand better how these the the reap uh, program directly benefits the participants. Okay, good. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal now. We'll ask some questions. Great, thank you so much. And um, similarly uh, to everyone from IBO here, it's been such a pleasure working with you. I can't believe it's already over. Um, on the but it's extraordinary working with you. I'm gonna start just with a quick um, capital question with my committee hat on. Um, and you know, for anyone watching the um, Independent Budget Office website has so much information on there. It's incredible. Anyone who's a budget geek should spend some time on your website. You have fantastic really helpful reports. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm just looking through your capital, uh, I'm focusing on the capital reports. Um, have you ever considered looking at, or would you consider looking at, at this juncture, um, the commitment, the commitment rate? And it looks like you have some reports already where you've looked at that somewhat, but you know, we learned this budget cycle that NYCHA, while they commit maybe 70% of their federal capital dollars, they only commit 5% of their city capital dollars, which really, um, I guess, explains why so little uh, is actually, uh, why it's so frustrating you know, for NYCHA residents waiting for uh, capital improvements. Um, that's just one example. And of course, this year we have the hiccup of, um, you know, in F during the pandemic, of course, the city overall was on a pause for it, for capital projects. But now they're coming off that pause and we just learned from the controller that they are speeding things up uh, like crazy to try to commit all the capital dollars. I think they, uh, the controller reported that they've committed 7.7 .7 billion to date, um, which is terrific. Um, and they, 
sorry, I'm sort of wandering here, I apologize, but I'm wondering if you would consider doing a report specifically on the commitment plan. You know, in, yeah. in fiscal year 19, they, they really hit it all out of the ballpark and then the pandemic pulled them back. I mean, hit it out of the ballpark, that's not fair, maybe to third base anyway. They didn't quite get there for their whole commitment plan. But would you, you know, consider doing a report, a big report on this um, because um, it's so critical. It's a critical part of the city's recovery. And, you know, there were um, changes made during the pandemic rules were loosened you know i would love to hear your thoughts about you know which of those you think we should continue you know when it's not an emergency um stuff like that okay um we would certainly consider it um jonathan is there anything other than sure we'll consider it of course um is there anything else we should say, Jonathan? Well, I think there's, and Councilmember Rosenthal is well, uh, is very knowledgeable about these things. And <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, I think some of the things when we look at commitments and commitment plans and commitment rates, we have to keep in mind is, uh, you know, as you know, a commitment is is a registered contract, and that doesn't necessarily mean a construction or a completion of a project. So while commitments are an important indicator and OMB uses them and all the agencies use them as their own indicator, there's sometimes they don't mean a lot to the people at, you know, on the ground who say, okay, the, plan, the project's been committed. What does that mean in terms of when it's gonna be done? So sometimes commitments are overstated as to the value of, of, of trying to look into them. Not that we shouldn't, and I think that's, in, in, and it's a good indicator agency to agency and, and within agencies year over year, uh, to compare how they're doing with their commitment plans, whether they're just overstating how much they can do, which is often an issue in a normal year, obviously, not in a COVID year. Um, also, you have issues with smaller agencies when they have larger projects. If it's one single large project that's committed, that can either overstate their percentage, or if that one project doesn't get committed in that specific amount of time, that can really uh, hamper their meeting their target. OMB usually sets a target of about 60% by agency. So those are just some of the things you have to keep in mind, not saying that it is not a, a worthwhile endeavor and something that I, th I think we could look in, obviously, if Ronnie is uh, committing us to it, we will do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, but those are some of the things you, you probably have to keep in mind with that. Gosh, you've already um, pointed out some of the important nuance that would have to be a part of this, that commitment is simply the first step and that, you know, so they get through commitments. So now what, you know, and you're right, it's a double headache. So, and I had never heard that number. That was really helpful that their goal is to get 60% of commitments out the door, um, wouldn't it be great if we got up to 100% out the door? How can we get there faster? Um, but you're right. And then the ramifications for the actual construction and you know the ability to spend those dollars. I see a very big report um, <laughs> that would be so helpful to the city to have and even incorporating, you know, some important ideas we talked about today, the capital project tracker, um, the idea of using um, nomenclature that is the same consistent throughout the city and forcing OMB to get that out there. So all the agencies have that. Um, boy, that would, I mean, do you agree with me that would make a real difference on transparency, you know, our goals of transparency? Um, well, certainly, you know, we, we've often talked about the capital budget in terms of how difficult it is to, to figure out what's actually in there and what's happening. 
we wrote a guide to reading the capital budget, trying to, to, to provide a little more transparency than is there. And whatever we can do to make the capital budget process more transparent, of course, we're going to do. So we'll, we'll definitely look into this. Um, I don't know how big, but... Um, I, you know, it's funny you should mention that, you know, that guide you put out is used by people throughout the city. You should know the value of that. Um, you know, uh, for example, at Coro, um, I think that's their standard guide when they have their budget week, you know, um, so, uh, Anyway, that guide is incredibly important. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up just on a, now that we've done capital, I'm going to cover some of the other uh, areas um, just to get your thoughts. Uh, first, talking about the change in population, and this really affected in New York City, and this really affected um, NYC. Um, uh, the Upper West Side a lot, um, and that is the loss of residents between January uh, during over 2020. And of course, we don't know whether or not that loss is permanent or if people will come back. I mean, we know somewhat for people who sold their homes. Um, but we overall lost about 70,000 residents um, have you take that into consideration in terms of doing your financial plan and estimates? And do you think that um, they'll come back or, or what do you think about that? Um, big, big questions again. Um, we try to take as much information as we can into account as we model. But I think that the numbers that we're looking for on population shifts aren't there yet. Um, and in fact, you know, many of us were surprised when the census numbers were released it was a couple of weeks ago now, uh, where New York State had as a whole done better than the numbers had suggested up until then. We still don't have the detailed numbers for New York City, but we're certainly gonna be looking at them as soon as they show. Yeah, I think that goes back to the long-term structural changes I was talking about. We're relying on a lot of those people to come, come back. And if they don't, we're relying on other people to take their place. George, do you have anything more specific, you know, other than my saying, we're still waiting for the better New York City numbers to arrive. Is there something else I can, we can say? Um, you know, I think... There are a couple other things to you know that that we are looking at that give us some sense that maybe you know you, you can't judge just by how many people have moved out of their apartments because in many cases they are still considered residents of the city. They're paying taxes. Um, they haven't sold their apartment or their home. Exactly. Uh, you know they're they may have registered their kids in another school district, but also with remote learning they were able to continue remote learning even in, uh, you, know, you know, in the Hamptons or, uh, you know, in, in the Catskills. Um, but, you know, and, and for example, one of the, one of the strengths in our economic, in our tax revenue forecast has been the personal income tax. Um, and there are reasons that, you know, we've, we've come to understand why the, why we underestimated personal income tax revenue. One is that um, you know, the distributional, the, the, the share of, of low income workers who lost their jobs was much higher than the share of higher income workers who yes. lost their jobs. Um, so that, you know, that, that explains part of why the, the personal income tax revenues are higher. But also if you think about it, that also means those high income, there's the, the there's some evidence that those high income residents, at least for, for the first year, still consider themselves New York City residents mm. because they're paying New York City residence tax. New York City does not have a non-residence tax. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's, 
you know, some small evidence that, you know, there, we're, we certainly don't, we certainly wouldn't want to assume that, you know, all of the people who left uh, certain neighborhoods in the city are never coming back. There's, there's reason to believe that at least some of them will. Got it, got it. Um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, next, uh, about the Relocation and Employment Assistance Program, REAP. Um, in one of IBO's budget options, you consider the pros and the cons of allowing um, the city's REAP to expire this program provides a break on the city's business taxes um, that help firms relocate to locations out of the core of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. It's used by a small number of firms uh, and doesn't seem to play a big role in the city's economic development. Um, as you know, the program is hard to study um, because uh, IBO is excluded by state law from obtaining the information on the program. Um, if you had access to the relevant data, what questions would you ask? Um, you know, one of the questions I think you'd want to, you know, I had mentioned a, a couple of things uh, with Chairman Drum earlier, but a couple, another one you might want to think about is, is it, you know, is, is the, the amount of the individual benefit set too high or too low? Um, you know, is there a, a you know, I, I believe it's $5,000 per employee now, and it's also, it's refundable in most areas where, where it applies. Um, you know, maybe that's too high. Could we could we find a way to to analyze the the data that would let us say you know you actually get you could get almost the same bang for the buck at you know a thousand dollars or at ten thousand I'm not saying I know exactly how I would do that but I think those would be some of the questions you'd want to you'd want to ask then the other thing I think you'd want to uh, ask about REAP is uh, you know the geography of it. what parts of the city are eligible. Are those districts, um, you know, maybe they once needed the benefit, but do they still need the benefit? Are there other districts that could benefit from it that uh, are not included in it? Um, those would be some, you know, some other types of questions about we you, you might want to try to answer. And um, do you think if the state law permitted this, do you think there that you could study the program? but still protect the privacy of firms that are getting the tax break uh, in the same way that yeah. the Department of Finance does? Um, I do. Um, you know, we, we have data sharing agreements with uh, many, many government agencies. Um, we have the, the Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor. Uh, we have a contract with them to share uh, employment records, which are considered you know, highly secret. Um, we have data from the Department of Education, a vast amount of data at the student level, which is um, you know, subject to all kinds. There's actually federal legislation that, that regulates much of that. And we've been able to develop protocols and standards on how we access that data. It's never caused any problem. Uh, the, you know, the DOE is completely satisfied with the way we handle that data. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other examples. We have data on the rent regulation status of every apartment in the city. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, again, we've signed not, you know, confidentiality agreements. We never were allowed to use the data at the individual level, but we have various protocols in place to, to limit how much we reveal in a table, for example. You know, we would never show there are only three people with a million dollars of X. Um, you know, we, we, we suppress that when, when, you know, you're getting too close to, to identifying single individuals. So there are, you know, we, we, we've worked this out in the past in other data areas, and I think we could do it in, um, in tax data as well. Yeah, that's such um, a great example 
that you just gave, I was about to ask you if you have DHCR data, could you look at, so here's another report, I sure. but I think it's smaller. Could you look at how much uh, 421A rent regulated apartments we've lost um, annually or by borough or by city council district? Um, and, and, you know, again, within the parameters of not sharing any, you know, specific apartment data. When you say we've uh, lost, lost, are you referring to- um... Year by year. So in other words, in the first year of a 421A, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, a building owner, developer will indeed set aside whatever the number is, 15%, 30% of the units to be a, um, affordable and the rest are market. So can you track over time, are those um, still um, being registered with DHCR over time? And this has become an issue in my district where I can't tell whether or not they are still being registered. Uh, but I do know that the building tenants, and we're investigating this with HPD, um, the rent, the tenants who should be able to stay now in rent regulation are yeah. getting market rate leases unintentionally, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm wondering if there's a way for you to track that. Uh, I'd have to go back and check and see. I know, I mean, the rent regulation in new 421A development works a little differently than rent regulation in, you know, in, in older buildings. Um, because when they go on, when the building first is completed and, and the units are first registered, if they're registered, there's, there are big issues about how many buildings actually comply with the registration requirement from the get-go. Yep. But when they're when they do get registered, um, you know they get registered at something a pro, you know something like a market price, you know so they're not it's not a, a the, the rent is um, you know it's the the regulation limits the increases after the first year. Uh, there's not necessarily a standard on what the uh, what that first year rent is, yeah. and so they yeah. they may not you know they may not look. Like your, you know, what you expect a, a rent regulated uh, lease to look like. Um, I think we could track it, but I'd have to, I'd have to check with the, the people who use that data. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I would love to follow up on that, and then I would, of course, obnoxiously ask you <laughs> if you could do it, you know, without abrogating your agreement by council district or by building. Um, all without abrogating your agreement. Uh, let, let me look into it. Yeah, great. Really appreciate that. Um, another question, and I think some of my colleagues maybe have questions. Um, and this is about the increased taxes on millionaires and what you think the impact will be. Um, and, and just, so, but here's the whole question with the state rate increase, the combined New York State and New York City personal income tax rate for affected millionaires rises to between 13.53% and 14.78%, the highest in the country. The next highest is California with a combined rate of 13.3%, so even lower than ours. The state's enacted budget increased its marginal tax rate on millionaires by adding three new brackets with higher tax rates beginning in 2021. That means that millionaires will now face the highest combined state and local tax rates um, in New York City than anywhere else in the US. Given that, um, 
the elimination of the cap on the salt deduction, the state rate increases will exacerbate the tax burden on New York City's millionaires. Do you think that the city risks losing its millionaires because of the increase in the state taxes? How much do you think it matters? And do you think, um, as we were talking about before, the opportunities for remote work heightens that risk? Um, certainly we believe it's a risk. Uh, we've spoken about it often. Um, and as you look at our array of options that we, hundred or so options that we put up on our website and refresh periodically, um, a lot of the options have to do with uh, taxation of very high income individuals. Um, the loss of the SALT deduction, the pandemic and remote work have all made that, those trade-offs more difficult for many people. Um, but we often discuss this issue in terms of just the very small number of individuals who are affected. So um, some of the data that we get access to that we are very careful with is uh, we have data on every New York City tax filer for each year. And then we model off of that and based upon numbers for 2019, if you look at the $50 million and above income category, and we publish all this stuff on our website, um, there are only 224 tax returns there. That's a very small number of returns. <laughs> And even if only a small fraction of those people vote with their feet, you will see an impact because those 224 tax filers in 2019 were responsible for 9% of the city's personal income tax revenues for that year, which is huge. Yeah. That, that if you, even if you relax it and you bring in the 25 to $50 million a year, I personally don't know any of these people, but. If you bring them in, um, you're adding another, uh, say, 4% of PIT revenue. So there's a huge amount of income tax revenues at stake for us. And even if only a relatively small number of people decide, of these multi-millionaires decide to leave, uh, we will feel it. Right, and it's so annoying, of course, because to them, I'm sure this increases chump change, but to New York City, it's so very uh, critical. Um, I don't know if they would call it chump change, but it's hard for me to project. <laughs> I shouldn't ascribe, I apologize. I shouldn't have ascribed any, <clears throat> any thoughts in their part. Um, do you, do, you, do you think that the Biden administration would lift the deduction? Cap. Uh, the cap. The I cap. think that, has, that, has, that, that, that has to go through the legislature. So it has Congress. It needs Congress. Yeah. yeah. And there, who knows? What, one point I would just make on the, um, to get into the weeds a little bit on the, the cap is it's important to remember that in New York, an awful lot of people before the, the 2017 law was changed, the law was changed in 2017, were, had already lost their state and local deductions because of something called the uh, AMT, the Alternative Minimum Tax. And the Alternative Minimum Tax um, you know, had a number of design flaws that it was originally intended to capture only millionaires who weren't paying even the, the statutory rate. Um, but because it wasn't adjusted consistent with the other changes in the, in the federal tax law, it wound up capturing more, it was in New York City, it was down to people, you could have people at 75,000 paying the AMT. So, and if you were on, if you were paying the AMT, you lost your state and federal deduction because that was one of the, the, the um, you know, the adjustments that were made in calculating the, the, the AMT base. So for many New Yorkers, 
we've actually lost the state and local deduction before uh, already. Mm -hmm. Where it comes into play is when you actually get up into the range of, of these taxpayers we were talking about a few minutes ago, because the way the the the, the um, flaws in the in the design of the AMT, it actually worked in reverse at the very high end. And uh, once you got up above a couple million, your AM, your risk of being on the AMT went down, and therefore. Um, those people were benefiting from the state and local deduction and have lost it. But for a large chunk of, of the city population, if you just like reversed everything back to where it was before the 2017 law, you still wouldn't have state and local deduction. Got it. I think maybe I get the, <laughs> except that I get the impact. Uh, so that's interesting. Thank you. Um, I think with that and the, you know, perhaps we can follow up sooner rather than later yeah. on some of those of things. Course. Thank you for that. I'd um, like to turn it back now to committee council. Thank you. If council members have questions for IBO, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for Sergeant in arms to let you know when your time begins. The sergeant would then let you know when your time is up. I'm looking at the queue right now to see if there's any hands raised. And Chair, it, it appears that there are no questions. Okay, thank you very much. So with that and with just tremendous gratitude to IBO and tremendous gratitude to the staff at the city council, for all their preparatory work um, and to the, of course, Sergeant in Arms for their help. Uh, this meeting has come to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. We'll be in touch.